Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chair Foster actually had a competing hearing this morning, so we'll be slightly delayed. I'm going to be kicking off our meeting this morning, so I'll call to order the meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board for April 17th. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Are we no. on the record? I need to be told if we're on the record. I think we'll start on the record when we uh, at the when we get to our um, One Care Vermont hearing. So I'll let you know, Maggie, when we're on the record, if that's Thank okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Jessica. You're welcome. Um, okay, so our first order of business actually is the Executive Director's Report, uh, Susan Barrett. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Board Member Holmes. I wanted to let folks know that next week we do not have a board meeting and uh, we have several public comment periods that are open. Um, the first one is a new one. Uh, we're going to be accepting public comments on the 2025 all payer model extension agreement. And we'll take those comments until April 26th. Uh, you'll hear later on this morning, a presentation from GMCB staff on that um, extension agreement. And the material we posted on our web is posted on our website. In addition, we have two ongoing public comment periods. First is regarding community engagement and to support hospital transformation. Please share any of your experiences you have with Vermont's healthcare system. Um, we're planning currently meetings to get out into the communities uh, later this summer. So this is phase two of this work. So we're really looking forward to continuing that community engagement. And uh, last but not least, um, we will we are accepting any comments regarding a next potential model with CMMI. Um, so currently we're accepting comments on the AHEAD model. And we share any of our comments with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading these uh, negotiations. And with that, I will turn it back to you, uh, Board Member Holmes. Great, thank you. Um, so our next order of business is the approval of the minutes from April 3rd. Do I have a motion for approval? So, so moved. Great, is there a second? Tom, can you second? I think Dave had to restart his computer, so if Tom can. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Perfect. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. So with that, it's the minutes are approved. Um, I think our next up order of business is to hear from our staff on the One Care Vermont revised fiscal year 2024 budget. At this point, I think it might make sense, Maggie, for you to, to be on the record. We'll start on the record now, if that's okay with you and your set. Yes, ma'am, we are now on the record. Okay, perfect. And we're gonna hear from Michelle Sawyer, our health policy project director, and Mark Hensler, our attorney. So this is our uh, staff introduction, Michelle and Mark. Great, thank you so much. So we're here this morning to hear from One Care Vermont. They will be presenting on their FY24 revised budget. <laughs> So the oversight of accountable care organizations is outlined in 18 VSA 9382 and Rule 5. There are two processes that are outlined. The first is certification, and the second one is the budget, which is why we're here today. The review of the ACO budget generally occurs annually during the fall prior to the start of the budget and program year, with payer, and con uh, payer contracts and attribution being finalized in the spring of the budget year. So because those are finalized in the spring, the ACO submits a revised budget. <clears throat> the board also monitors ACO activities and performance throughout the year to ensure compliance with the requirements of budget approval, known as conditions, and to ensure that the ACO is operating as required by Vermont's all-payer model agreement. I'm gonna pass it over to Mark um, to cover a few more standards of review. Yeah, so a little background, um, the fiscal year 24 budget guidance and the budget order required One Care to provide uh, revised budget deliverables. Um, we're here today because the fiscal year 24 budget order required One Care then to present on its budget uh, following those deliverables. So that's what today is all about. Um, the 
process that we're kind of looking ahead to is that um, the board is reviewing revised budget uh, under rule 5.407. Um, so after one care presents today, staff will review deliverables and come back to the board in early May with information about any performance, if there is any, that is varied substantially from the budget. If the board finds that there has been substantial variation from the ACO's budget, then upon application of the ACO, the board may adjust the budget. Um, but if performance is not varied substantially, then no action is taken under Rule 5.407. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. All right, so um, usually not a good idea to put a lot of text on a slide and read it all out, but I am going to do that. Um, so we're, we're specifically today looking at uh, information under budget condition 12 of the fiscal year 24 um, budget order. Um, so this is what one care is is presenting on today. Uh, First, final fiscal year 24 attribution and finalized payer contracts, revised budget based on final attribution, uh, final description of population health initiatives, um, expected hospital dues for 2024 by hospital, expected risk for 2024 by one care, held risk, risk bearing entity and payer, any changes to the overall risk model for uh, 2024, sources of funds for One Care's 2024 population health management programs, status of the Medicare ACO performance benchmarking system, update on the results of evaluations as described in the fiscal year 24 budget submission, update on the partnership between One Care and UVM exploring additional partnerships around evaluation, One Care's progress relative to targets for commercial payer FPP levels, uh, and a statement of how the funds reduced from operating expenses were reallocated to population health and primary care programs. Um, uh, and that's uh, that's in total what we're uh, what we're looking at today as one care presents. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you. So here's an agenda for today. We just went through the staff info. Uh, next, we'll hear from one care uh, as they present their revised budget. There will be time for staff and board questions, as well as questions from the healthcare advocate and public comment. And here's just a quick timeline around the revised budget process. We received um, one care submission April 2nd. We're here today on the 17th for their hearing. On the 30th, the staff is anticipating an updated ACO performance benchmarking report, uh, a settlement policy, and uh, an update on their corporate goal achievement. All of those are due from One Care by that date. And um, on May 8th, as Mark mentioned, there will be a staff analysis on One Care's FY24 revised budget. And at this point, I will hand it back to you, board member Holmes. Great, thank you. Um, I think we'll turn it over to the One Care team, uh, Abe Behrman and but I do think we're going to have to swear in the witnesses. Mark, are you able to do that for us? Happy to, Member Holmes. Um, who from One Care is going to be speaking today? Good morning. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties, so I think we're trickling in now. But this is Tom Boris. I'll be speaking, and Abe Berman is joining as well. Okay. Uh, do we have Mr. Berman yet? Let me make sure he has the correct link. I think we had the wrong link in our meeting invite, so let me make sure he has it. Just one moment. Sure.
while we wait for Abe, sorry about this. I'm happy to be in the presentation if that's appropriate, or we can continue to wait. Yeah, we can. Um, let, let's do this, Mr. Boris. I'll go ahead and uh, swear you in. And then once he's able to log on, we can take another pause and, and swear him separately. I think that'd be fine. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to swear you in with the oath prescribed for witnesses. If you can go ahead and please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. All right, thank you. You're sworn in. And uh, member Holmes, I'll pass it back to you and I'll, I'll probably interrupt midway once uh, we have uh, the, the second uh, swearing in that we will need to do later. Okay, fantastic. Well, then I guess I will just turn it over to you, Tom, if you want to kick us off with the presentation. Excellent. Thank you all. Again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully we can get back on track pretty quickly here. So I'm going to walk us through a presentation of the uh, request per the budget orders for informational updates, and then we'll be happy to take questions at the conclusion. And I will share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Excellent. Thanks. Okay, uh, we are here to discuss the revised 2024 budget. He will be joining momentarily, and then myself and Tom Boris, CFO for One Care Vermont. Nice to see you all today. So, in terms of the uh, discussion today, um, here's just a quick overview. We received the budget orders on February 29th, the leap day. Uh, the the One Care Board of Managers took action in the uh, March governance cycle to accommodate orders as needed. And this presentation is structured to go through the informational updates requested or required in the budget orders and show the strategies that we'll use to comply with the budget orders come year end. And at this point in time, one can makes no requests related to the approved 2024 budget or the budget orders. So first, final attribution and finalized payer contracts. This is a snip right from uh, a number of materials that we submitted for the for those listening in, there are Excel documents and adaptive documents that have a lot more detail beyond what you'll see here today. I invite you to go look at those tabs at your leisure. Uh, but here's an update on the attribution. The initial Medicare and Medicaid numbers came in very close to estimate. For example, Medicare, um, we estimated 67,870, came in at 66,7. Very normal variation, close to plan. Similarly with Medicaid. One change I'll note is that we've updated our estimate of settlement attribution. That's which incorporates the attrition we experienced throughout the year. We're seeing a little bit slower redetermination pace than we initially expected last summer, and also some changes to the way that DIVA is handling uh, attributed kids. Some of them are actually coming back into the mix later on. Did not anticipate that early on. So we were expecting higher settlement attribution from a budgetary standpoint. I'm comfortable with that because Medicaid's PMPM funds the incentives that we make to the provider network. So as attribution is higher or lower, it kind of floats in balance. For um, commercial attribution, apologies for the redactions here, but uh, we expect it to be slightly higher than we initially estimated. It's not a huge number to begin with, but I think it's a positive outcome that will be a little bit higher than we initially planned. So that's a good thing. And then in terms of finalized payer contracts, we've submitted all the contracts to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, high level negotiations yielded very similar structures to those included to the, into the budget. So no material shifts in terms of the form and function of those particular contracts. The most significant change that was made was increasing the Medicare risk corridor per the Green Mountain Care Board order. So it was increased from 3% as initially planned up to 4%. Next, revised budget based on final attribution. So the budget was modified by the Green Mountain Care Board in two ways. And I, by budget, I mean specifically the financial components here. First, operating expenses were reduced by 957,000, and then with a companion order to reallocate the reduction to population health and primary care programs <clears throat> that will achieve the best return on investment. So the One Care Board of Managers authorized reinvestment in two initiatives. One is 250,000 for restoration of the regional clinical representative model. This is something that we've used in the past where we had um, practicing primary care clinicians or practitioners 
champion the population health model program with other primary care uh, providers as really kind of a peer-to-peer -peer model. So we put some money back into the budget to fund this and try and get a little bit more engagement from primary care providers across the network. Second, we increased the population health model bonus pool by 1.1 million, just shy of 1.2 actually. However, after applying the 60% payout rate that we incorporate into the original budget, that boils down to an expected 707,000 of payment out the door. And in total, those the 707 plus the 250 balances out with the 957,000 of uh, operating expense reduction. I will say we, we didn't go line by line in the operating expense reduction for a couple of reasons. But one dynamic that is going on is we've lost a number of key positions at OneCare and have a number of vacancies. And in the past, we've been pretty good at managing our expenses relative to budget. So we believe and recommended this to the OneCare board that we, throughout the course of the year, capture the savings as they're presented to us and many have already showed up. So our, our hope is that we can find the 957,000 of operating expense savings throughout the year in a way that doesn't hinder the rest of the work that we aspire to do with our provider network. In other words, I didn't want to make a bunch of cuts that would really limit what we can do with the network and then have other savings materialize at the same time. So we plan to work this number throughout throughout the year with intent to comply with the operating expense cap per the budget order. Next, final description of population health initiatives. So all the population health initiatives remain in the form initially presented with just a couple of the exceptions, and I won't repeat everything about these, but I'll just note them again. The 250,000 for the regional clinical representatives and increasing that bonus pool for the population health model program. One other noteworthy change relates to the mental health screening and follow-up program which now requires participants to meet a 70% screening rate to earn the second payment. In the first year, it was a pay to play kind of model, just participate in the screening initiative, report your screening rates. This year, it's a bit of a hybrid. The first payment is guaranteed, participate in the program, but the second payment is dependent on meeting that screening rate threshold. Second, a portion of the program funding is earmarked for investment in a virtual mental health service for those with positive screening results. So in a stepwise manner, this program was designed to really expand the practice of mental health screening, but that begs the question, what happens when you have somebody with a positive result? We know we have limited capacity in this space within the state, so we're exploring actively uh, right now a uh, partnership with a, a service, a virtual service for mental health supports and making sure that the providers in the One Care Network have access so that they can refer their patients with positive screening results to this service. All right, next, excuse me, expected hospital dues. Because the operating expense reduction is balanced by reinvestment in the population health initiatives, there is no change to the overall uh, dues model or the dues allocation. So these numbers remain unchanged from the initial, initial budget. Next slide, expected risk uh, for 2024 by one care held risk, risk bearing entity and by payer. I'll invite you to look at tab 5.1 in the uh, submitted Excel documents. It has a matrix of HSA, hospital, primary care, hospital employee, primary care, and the allocations of risk accordingly. But just thought I'd put a summary on this slide here. We're estimating total program risk to be 32 million, just, just over 32. The advanced shared savings risk, just shy of 10 million, which comes into play if the Medicare settlement actually exceeds the risk corridor limit due to the advanced shared savings component. We hope that doesn't happen, of course. And then there's a breakdown by the different entity types, just shy of 2.5 million is held by primary care organizations across the network. 32 million is held by risk bearing entities. And in our world, that means the hospitals right now. And then the amount held by one care is just over seven and a half million, and that is made up of two components. One is a risk mitigation arrangement we had with NVRH for the St. Johnsbury HSA, and then the other is the one percent uh, increase to the Medicare risk corridor that one care is ordered to hold. And you can see the proportions in the pie chart.
changes to the overall risk model for 2024. Other than the order to increase the Medicare risk corridor for one care to hold the incremental 1%, no other changes to the risk sharing model. Uh, at the time that this was written, the policy was going through the April governance cycle uh, through OneCare's Finance Committee and Board to incorporate this 1% being held at OneCare. I can report that as of last night, it has been approved. We will submit that uh, promptly to you just to see that the, the policy has been modified to say that we will comply with the nature of this order. Next source of funds for OneCare's population health management programs. No substantive changes here either. The operating expenses are funded by hospital participants in the network, and so too are the uh, areas that we allocated the reinvestment in population health and quality. So it's a net neutral from uh, really that the source and use standpoint. It's really just that funds that otherwise would have been invested in the uh, operating expenses of the organization are now going to those population health and primary care initiatives as ordered all sourced by hospital funds. Next, status of the Medicare ACO performance benchmarking system. Uh, the OneCare team has met with uh, team members from the Green Mountain Care Board in March to discuss uh, statistical significance analysis requirement described in the uh, budget order. Through that process, of course, there's clarifying questions raised about how to approach this, uh, a couple different options for how to do it. Um, there was mutual agreement that further discussion was warranted to make sure that whatever modifications are built into this benchmarking tool are meet the needs of the Green Mountain Care Board and the staff. Um, next, the first biannual benchmarking report due date was extended to April 30th on track for a timely submission later this month and will include risk levels. All the numbers in there are risk adjusted, but uh, the recommendation is that we include the actual risk levels uh, for transparency. And then the second semi-annual report due in September will include a statistical significance analysis. Again, we got to figure out the exact details of that, but that's the intent for the September version of this report. Next update on the results of evaluations as described in the fiscal 24 budget submission. We are actively engaged with a third party vendor uh, to perform evaluation of its 23 population health model. Um, the framework consists of both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Uh, the One Care Network's been notified and, and asked, encouraged to participate in the qualitative analysis analyses. I do think they're important, those qualitative components. And uh, reports in the two analyses will be delivered to One Care in the summer and fall timeframes. And then recommendations for 2025 and beyond will be delivered at the end of 2024. So throughout the rest of this, calendar year, we'll be getting more information from this third party vendor. Next, update on the partnership between OneCare and the University of Vermont to explore additional partnerships around evaluation. Uh, short story here, there's nothing active with the UVM team at present. We're using this other evaluation partner for a lot of that work. We don't have any uh, engagements planned at this time with the University of Vermont. Certainly open to it in the future, but right now, nothing active. One Care's progress relative to targets for commercial payer uh, FPP levels, that's fixed prospective payment levels. Uh, high level, there's been no significant changes to the payer contracting landscape that materially impacted the fixed payment progress relative to the report from last year. However, uh, I'd like to add a couple other developments that we have underway that I'm personally excited about. In January, we did launch a fixed payment expansion with Medicaid. They, they call it the Global Payment Program or GPP. You might see both uh, in different documentation. We launched this fixed payment expansion uh, exclusively with the CPR practices in January because of the financial materiality. It was easy to, easier to launch for uh, DIVA. Um, all good things to say, it's worked well. Claims seem to be paying properly. We've received very few questions from practices, which is encouraging that they've really figured out how to manage these fixed payment arrangements. And now they have a more holistic model where all of their attributed population, or beyond their attributed population for Medicaid, they're all covered by this fixed payment. So you don't have as much of a, some fee for service, some fixed payment within the Medicaid uh, payer landscape. Next, 
we are ready to launch the GPP initiative with five hospitals in July. Uh, it is pending DIVA funding appropriations. And uh, if you've been following along, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but we're um, hopeful that the funding will be there so that DIVA can cover what they call the claims tail or the cash flow advance that these hospitals would, would receive by moving onto a fixed payment arrangement uh, relative to fee for service. So ready to roll in that space. We also remain in conversations and are kind of doing a shadow model with a number of FQHCs for a Medicaid fixed payment initiative. Um, we're building on concepts from the, the, the CPR program, but the organizations are not the same. FQHCs build quite differently than independent primary care practices do. So there are a couple of modifications, but the concepts are very similar. And we've borrowed a few of the elements from that CPR program to deliver what I think is a pretty nice looking model for FQHCs. And there's been some been some real interest in it. So we're anticipating and hoping for a 7-1 start date. Uh, again, there's a lot of moving parts in the in the world right now, but this would be our ideal is that we could launch this, test it out with a few uh, willing participants and, and build on that into the future. Uh, this is a, a repetition here, but a statement of how the funds reduced from operating expenses were reallocated to population health and primary care programs. Uh, just to say it again, 250,000 for the RCR model, regional clinical representative model, and then the 1.2 to the PHM bonus pool, but that should sugar down to roughly 707,000 after that 60% payout rate included in the initial budget submission. I believe that is it for the slides. We literally just want to wanted to go through the budget order, what was required for us to present, and then give this board uh, opportunity to ask questions. Great, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, at this point, I think I'll turn it over to staff. If staff have questions, great, thank you. Um, so I'm curious how OneCare decided that the regional clinical representatives and the bonus pools were the best return on investment for those $957,000. Um, I'd love to hear specifically about what evidence there is that the RCR program has been uh, impactful in the past. Sure, I can, I'll take it, um, I'll start with the PHM uh, concept first. That is one that we've been working on for a number of years now, had it, having a glide path to increase the weight on the bonus. We talked about it in testimony last winter. Um, my sense was that the board appreciated that concept of reducing the base payment and increasing the bonus pool. And the, the order said um, we should make these investments consistent with the other findings in the uh, originally approved budget. So we, we did so accordingly. It felt like a good alignment space where we believe that's the right thing to do. And, and my sense was that the Green Mountain Care Board supported this particular direction as well. So that that's for why we decided to put the funds into that pool. Also, it just enhances the importance of outcomes, which I think we can all agree upon as being a, a good thing. Regional clinical representatives is a little bit more of an anecdotal decision. Um, but, you know, candidly, we, we struggle that everybody in the provider network is really busy. There's a lot to do, a lot of fires to put out and manage on a day-to-day -day basis and having a few champions out there to really push on the population health model measures, help support other practices in a pr primary care provider to primary care provider way uh, felt important to us. And it's a really a way to try and engage the provider community in a, in a deeper way into these initiatives and help drive positive outcomes and results within their communities. And I'll I'll hop in for a minute, uh, Mr. Berman. I see you here. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. I'll um, quickly swear you in, assuming that you're going to want to provide some testimony as well, um, and then we can just move along. Um, so uh, go ahead, please, and uh, raise your right hand, and I'll swear you in with the oath uh, prescribed for witnesses. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thanks very much. You are sworn in. I uh, agree with everything that Tom just provided in terms of testimony. I, I just add that um, one of the things we struggle with when it comes to our quality metrics in the PHM model is awareness, Michelle. Um, although the contracted entity itself and the person who contracted with us is aware of those, we've 
found um, universally that the providers on the ground who are focused mostly on their day-to-day -day work are maybe not as aware of the initiatives that we have. So part of the role of those RCRs is to build awareness and make sure that people know that this is part of the measurement process of our population health management program. Again, that sounds like it would be just a universal that people would know, but these are folks that are really overworked and have very little administrative time. So it's it's sort of a, a little bit of an awareness campaign more than anything else. And I'll just tell you, we're struggling to recruit those RCRs. Generally, the message is we, we think it's great, but we don't have enough time available to donate to the effort, not donate, but really even be paid for the effort. We're offering compensation. So um, we may end up having to put more money into the PHM program itself, as Tom mentioned, just because we can't get enough uptake on the RCR program. But um, as he said, it's largely anecdotal, but we have heard from folks that they would you know, like to have somebody sort of as a champion of it out there. So that's what we, we tried to provide in this program. That's very helpful. Thank you. No problem. Great. So um, as mentioned, when slide nine was on, and you, you don't need to bring it up, um, there are hospital dues that ended up in the PHM bonus pool because of part of the cut. Um, and I was curious if those dollars were paid out first. Um, and if not, um, if the money from payers is paid out first, is there a circumstance where the bonus pool really isn't emptied fully and you're left with money that originated from hospital dues? Um, is there a plan in advance for what one care might do with those dollars? Sure. So uh, good question. Um, really the payments to the network are dictated per the, the contractual terms that those participants sign with us. So we are obligated to pay whatever they've earned in the, the population health model program. Funds behind the scenes are, are managed through the source and, and use is something we created early on to make sure that we had a good tab on any re revenues or funds coming in, where they were going and make sure, making sure we're compliant with contracts in particular. There's really not an order of operations, but part of our budget process is really to matrix all those inflows and outflows so that we are certain that we are uh, spending the payer contributions from Medicaid or commercials compliantly with their contracts. And then if we had any um, hospital uh, part funds coming in to support that, we use those thoughtfully. There's, there's really not an order of operations, but there is a possibility at the end of the year, we could either be over or under budget on that population health model expenditure. And my answer is it's conditional upon how that happens and shakes out. But first, we make sure we comply with every contract. That's very important to me. We're audited uh, for things like that. And then if we had funds left over, it's it's both a discussion with our uh, hospitals and our, through our finance committee and our board to determine what's the best course of action. And the materiality of that might matter. The performance that we experienced might matter as well. And if there's opportunities to reinvest, that might be a choice. We've had that happen in the past where um, we didn't spend or pay out as much as we anticipated, but there was a lot of positive momentum behind the initiative, and there was a, you know, a decision to defer funds into a future year, for example, to reinvest in the work because we believed it was on the right track. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, One Care submitted the new mental health screening and follow up um, programs policy. Um, and it described the total program budget in that policy as $2,056,050. Um, um, but however, in what I'm seeing in both the revised, uh, initial and your revised budget submissions, I'm seeing like 1.67 million. And I just didn't know if there was an explanation for those two different numbers that I've seen. That's a, actually an interesting segue because we did the finance committee at the end of 2023 decided to use some unspent funds in that particular, that, that OneCare had to reinvest in the mental health screening initiative for next year. So that's probably what you're seeing. If you had a, if you want to send me a, a question that like specifically referencing the numbers, I can answer in a more informed way, but we've increased the pool through the use of deferred funds um, from last year so that there's more available to the providers. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we had asked OneCare to submit their administrative budget broken out by program or function of the ACO, and you shared that it really isn't possible to do in what you feel like is an accurate way. Um, and I'm hoping to get some additional insight into the specific barriers to this. And I, and I understand why retrospectively it might not be possible, but I'm curious what are the reasons that OneCare couldn't start tracking usage of these dollars now um, so that you would have an idea going forward. You'd have an idea of what programs cost to run versus how much value those programs offer to Vermont. Sure, good question. So um, just to set the, the landscape a little bit, all of these initiatives have components of um, finance, contracting, communications, the value-based care strategy, the clinical strategy. So whenever an initiative is developed, managed, just run throughout the course of the year, there are uh, contributors from all the teams at OneCare. We worked really hard to make sure that we operate in this very kind of um, dynamic way so that we don't have initiatives that are led just by finance and initiatives led just by clinical. That, that does not make sense either to us from an internal operations standpoint or for external uh, participants, if you know this thing is over here and you got to talk to this person to get answers, or this initiative is over here and you have to talk to that person to get answers. So we've done a lot of work to break down silos within the organization. That is in contrast to an ask of saying, here's a budget for the mental health screening initiative, for example. So when we have a meeting to discuss evolution of that program or look at data, there will be a member or members from the finance team and the value-based care team communications team all contributing to that. Going back in time, I agree with what you said, it would be a lot of guesswork to estimate how much time any one person's uh, spent on each initiative, and there are many. So this is just one example of many, many initiatives that they contribute to. So I don't feel confident that I can go back in time and provide a reliable estimate on an initiative by initiative basis. Moving forward, we could do this, but I caution because it would be incredibly administratively burdensome for the staff. Every meeting would need to be cataloged. How much time did you spend on this initiative? You jump to the next meeting, that's gonna have a different mix of where you spent your time. And it's not just the staff time. If there's travel to a meeting, that travel expense needs to be assigned to whatever initiative was being discussed. And it's not always one. We'll do a site visit to a practice and we'll talk about the mental health screening initiative and the population health model program and potentially a fixed payment initiative like CPR or the FQHC model. So really the challenge that I face from a, a budget, finance, accounting standpoint is how much effort it requires of the staff, which not only the, the designer of the programs, manager of the programs, but the accounting staff behind the scenes to accurately segment how much cost each initial initiative uh, generated. So it's really a, a challenge from a, a burden standpoint and an administrative task standpoint. Um, I'm open to having different conversations about how we could do that to meet your needs, but that's been my biggest concern is that a lot of time and effort would go into tracking this. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last question, um, does OneCare plan on updating their provider network agreements to better track how funds meant to support primary care are being used for that purpose for 2025? We are in the process of designing our 2025 payer contracts now. I don't know the specific answer to that question. It's a good one, but we will keep that in mind as we proceed and develop those contracts. Great, thank you. Back to you, um, Member Holmes. Thank you, Michelle. Um, at this point, I guess we'll open it up for some board questions. Do board members have questions for the ACO team? Not seeing any questions. Go ahead, Dave. Um, so I'm sorry, I think I might have missed some of the details when you're talking about the mental health screening services. <laughs> Um, I think it was slide six ish or five. Um, so 25% of, uh, could you, could you just clarify that for me? 25% of 
what funds are going to that and then that, how do you see that being utilized and, and my my impression is that this is going to be mvp has a virtual mental health screening service for its members so this would be from medicare and medicaid members and i guess my question is then are you paying direct to the mental health screening virtual company sure so i, I can give you a sense of uh, what I think that this will ultimately become, but just to say it, it's still kind of being worked out with a, a potential partner in the space. But of the pool of funds available, a subset earmarked to develop this concept of having uh, the provider participants within the One Care Network have access to this virtual mental health service. The idea is, um, or my understanding is, that there would be some sort of a base payment to, to make sure that the participants in One Care's network have access to the service, the actual service provider can bill, I, I know Medicare at least, and I think we're exploring Medicaid as well, so they can still bill the fee-for-service claims for that work, but the payments that we'd make would give the providers access to the service. Okay, so that's, so One Care is not paying out of One Care funds for the service, the service is billing the Medicare and Medicaid Medicare and Medicaid for fee for service. It's a both where there's a, a cost to have access to the service. Right. Kind of like okay. being a, you know, you're eligible to refer your patients through it. And then that service can also bill the claims, which I, I think is good. It it's um you know certainly more cost efficient for us rather than having to pay for them the, for the claims and whatever administrative fees they have as well. So I, I think it's a good balance where we can give everybody access to this. They can use it at their discretion. And then the, the service will take care of the billing of the claims. Okay. And do you have from this year's work with doing the mental health screening, any idea of uh, how many patients are likely to use this service? I don't have that answer, but we can, I can ask the, uh, the team that's a little bit closer to the mental health data to see if they have any information. Okay. And then another question I have is this, the regional, what's the RCP stand for again? Regional clinical. Representative. RCR, RCR, sorry. Yep. How many RCRs are you expecting to have? Like how does the. Wanted to have 10 of them, which, you know, we could, that means that we can spread them out geographically across the state. One of the real challenges that we have, um, and I've learned this through speaking with a number of other ACOs across the country, is that we're so geographically diffuse that it's it's sometimes hard to feel really engaged with, you know, Brattleboro or Bennington because we're just far. It feels far away. The scope of the world's not, but it just feels far away. So having a regional clinical representative down there, closer to the teams, embedded in the organizations. Feels like a, a strategy to support what Abe spoke of. Okay, and just so I understand, is the idea that then you would kind of fund flow some amount of money for this FTE to whatever their parent organization is, and then they would have protected FTE from their parent organization? Yep, that's it. And we built in some. Um, outcomes based components of it so that if they're really effective and they can help raise the the bar on the population health model outcomes there's more funds for that particular rcr than one that that didn't achieve that uh, result if i could just add dr Merman, is, dr. So Merman, I just add, you know i know tom said we we budgeted for 10 in this we're we're, we're we won't have that many we're struggling to recruit as i mentioned earlier so um We'll 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 ultimately see how much interest we get, and it's it's been less than we would have hoped for. And then with the program evaluation ROI component, um, so I understand that these get complicated to get down into the details, and I think that this is pretty common for organizations to try to figure out what's the relative cost of a particular program compared to the potential benefit of that program, um, and that I think that having a, a super accurate estimation of the costs would be probably not cost effective. Um, we could calculate the ROI on the calculating the ROI, but it would be really helpful to have a, you know, a rough estimate 
of the relative costs of the programs to then identify the relative benefit of the programs to get an ROI. I think this is something the board has been expressed significant interest in and over the last couple of years. And I, I would really find that helpful to understand. And I think, you know, looking forward into the next, um, you know, federal agreements and where one care sits within that, it would be really helpful, I think, for, I would think for one care, but also for, you know, all of us in Vermont to start to develop an understanding of what the relative benefit of each program is and what's worth trying to maintain over time and what's worth, you know, what seems to not have, have, have met the sort of whatever threshold of effectiveness from that standpoint, whether it be clinical or financial, to continue. So I, I would just continue to encourage not seeing all of the challenges to getting it absolutely accurate, but trying to think about what are the ways that we could get, that, that you could get close enough to be relatively accurate. Understand the caveats that it's impossible to, you know, think of one care as six separate businesses, you know, cohabiting the same organization. I agree with you in concept. I wonder, though, this is just for consideration of us all, is whether or not ROI is actually the right term. And I'll tell you where I struggle with that is ROI is really a measurement through the eyes of the investor is if you're going to invest a certain amount of money, what kind of return do you get back from that? So often the questions we get about ROI are different than that. It's some other, like this person hasn't really been the investor in it, so it's hard for me to, or any of us really, to show that something that we did had particular value for, for them. So we could do ROIs for sure. I mean, I, I look at this frequently, the investments that hospitals have made relative to their own uh, return and the outcomes of shared savings and losses and what it meant, meant for our ability to move funds into primary care and other parts of the healthcare system. But that's a really financial focus, which is what an ROI is good at doing. It's it's harder when we're getting to a, a different type of perspective of what's the you know global value of doing this kind of work. So I don't know if changing that term would help us have a better way of thinking about this, but that's where I personally have struggled with the ROI framework a little bit. I appreciate that, and I think a lot of the complexity of this type of work is that the the R is hard to quantify uh, the return on the money that's put in. Um, the I, or you know, we could say a cost benefit analysis, or uh, and and some of that could be qualitative. But I think the cost part, I think, has been the challenge. They're both they're both challenging, but at least the cost part. Um, and whether or not that you want to think about as cost or, you know, the amount that you've invested as an organization as the I would be helpful, I think, because if we can understand what the various programs costs cost, and then I think, say, for like the CPR program, for instance, there's a lot of vagueness, right? So supporting primary care providers um, and independent practices has many benefits beyond just the direct payment to those primary care providers. And so the, the, the benefit becomes complicated, but at least we can start to develop a framework of how to think about the relative value of these um, programs. Dave, before you go on, I just I just want to make sure that um, I saw Abe's hand go up and I saw Tom's hand go up. So I don't know if everybody wants to uh, weigh in on this particular line of questioning. I wanted to allow that. So Abe, if you want to just jump in and then maybe I'll turn it over to Tom and then back to you, Dave, for more follow up questions. Does that sound good? OK, great. So Abe. Sure. I just wanted to add, uh, Dr. Merman, I, I completely appreciate what you're saying. Um, I think trying to regress out the value of certain initiatives is important as we think about what the next phase is. I wonder how relevant, given all of the dynamics that we have currently that exist and what likely will exist in the future, how much value there is doing it in, in the final period of the all-pair model. Um, it reminds me a lot of the work I did looking at healthcare costs, both direct and indirect, about 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, this is when the, the time-driven activity-based costing movement was really hot in healthcare and trying to figure out exactly how much value and how much cost you had with each element of care. I think what they came to was, as you said, sometimes 
coming up with rougher estimates actually had more value because the actual cost of trying to get the super detailed information exceeded the value of what you'd get out of it and then took away from the ability to actually deliver care. I mean, in a perfect world, I, I do think we'd have like a bit of a controlled experiment technique where we'd be able to see exactly what it costs to do each thing. The reality is it's probably a blend. Um, the easiest thing you mentioned the CPR program is probably to look at the direct costs associated with it. So we know how much money we put out there in the CPR program. Um, the indirect costs, I think it's best that we do a pretty high level estimate on, lest we incur more costs trying to measure those indirect costs and we actually get back in value. It's just just my two cents on it, but I understand your perspective and, and value it. Tom, go ahead and then back to you, Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jess, and thank you, Tom and Abe, for joining us today. And I just I want to agree with what you've both been saying. Right? I think ROI, to calculate an ROI is extremely detailed and difficult in its truest sense. And you end up having to quantify and monetize outcomes that matter to patients. You measure those by asking questions. And then trying to attach a dollar amount to it becomes very difficult and, and feels rather disingenuous, right? So um, I think ROI probably has been um, not the best term to, to use. Um, and the traditional way of tracking value that Abe was talking about does often collapse under its own weight. And as Dave said, can the cost of doing um, in-depth cost allocation can can be um, not worth it. But but having said all that, I, high performing ACOs, at least the the couple dozen that I've worked with, do find a way to measure these things. They measure outcomes that matter to patients, and their personnel keep track of how much time they spend working on each project, so that they can track which projects. Are, or programs are having the biggest impact for the dollar. Some programs get um, shelved because they're not producing outcomes that are, are sufficient. Um, others get expanded because of that information. And so it's really necessary to optimize the, the value that a community is receiving from a, a service organization like an ACO. Um, so like, Dave mentioned, I'd really, I want to, um, I think with a year left, like it's silly to demand, but I really want to encourage you to think about ways to do this if your work continues in the future. It's for your benefit and for the community's benefit and for ours as regulators. Um, I, I, I just think it's it's hard to do the, the work well without it. Um, and also, Tom, your, your point about switching to something where everybody does track their hours, um, that will be painful and will take time initially. Uh, but I have to do it in this role now. I have to log these hours spent in this meeting differently than I logged hours yesterday. And I have to do that as a consultant. As an academic, I have to log academic teaching hours, research hours, service hours. Um, it, it's a standard way of doing things. So um, I don't buy the the high burden. It, it's a burden to change. I, I agree with that, but um, I don't think it's a burden ongoing. So I, I want to, in the most positive way possible, encourage you to, to think about a way to, to move toward this and to be doing it um, if you're serving Vermonters in the future. Thank you. Great, then I will kick it back over to you, Dave, if you have further questions. I'm all set, thanks. Okay. Tom or Robin, do you have further questions? None from Tom, Robin. Thanks. Um, Dave actually asked some of the questions that I had, so some of mine have been taken care of. Um, I did have a couple questions about the Medicaid global payment program um, that I wanted to ask. So uh, it's my understanding that uh, this program 
essentially provides fixed payments for non-attributed lives and as such is not actually part of the medic the medicaid aco shared saving shared losses program but i wanted to confirm that just so that that's make sure my you, understanding was right you are absolutely correct these are the Really, the idea was to broaden the scope of the fixed payment that the hospitals received to those unattributed lives because their care is more you know, stable and at a macro level, but not take on the financial accountability for those lives because we don't have a primary care relationship established with those particular people. How that could evolve in the future is something that we've discussed with Diva. Maybe there's a different structure for that, but this was kind of the initial step uh, that we wanted to take together. Okay, great. Yes, that's that's what how I thought it was working, but just wanted to confirm. Um, let me just check. I think that was actually I think Dave covered I had uh, questions about mental health screening, but he covered those. Um, I guess I had one follow up on the RCR program. So my recollection, which could certainly be faulty, was in the prior iteration of this program that the RCR uh, folks were working with the blueprint community health teams or the accountable community for health teams in the local region. Is that also how you're thinking about this next iteration or is there a different sort of rollout that you would anticipate assuming you can get folks uh, to to sign up to be those representatives. Or maybe you're leaving it to the locals. I don't know. Just wanted to ask about it's how a, that you were thinking about that. It's a good question. I don't know exactly how anyone RCR would approach their strategy or we would uh, direct that in some way or another. I think it's a both, honestly. I think that there has to be some peer-to-peer -peer interaction with, with practices, especially the independents or the smaller ones. And then also the hospital ploy, which to Abe's point, sometimes it's harder for the messages to get down. And we need to be very mindful. There's a lot of different um, teams and initiatives out there, and it's very easy to have too many cooks in the kitchen on something. So I think it's got to be collaborative with the other initiatives up and running, and we got to get some direct provider to provider engagement. That makes sense. In the really ancient history, <laughs> I remember when VPQ was doing uh, programs where they would do provider to provider quality improvement projects where they were kind of running things in local regions to kind of enhance the quality improvement. So it sounds like we it may be sort of revitalizing some of that work that had happened. Um, at least in my rec it may have happened in other ways as well, but at least in my ancient history recollection through VPQ. Um, okay, I think that's all I had. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions, uh, I think, and then I think we might take a quick recess because I think then Chair Foster will be back and he has some questions as well. So I think I'll ask mine and then we'll take a quick probably five to ten minute recess. Uh, my first question is about the evaluation of the 2023 uh, population health model with a third party vendor that you have um, called upon to help you with that. I'm wondering if there's a strategy to increase the response rate of your provider network. My understanding of my vague, if memory serves, recollection is the surveys that have been done of providers in the past had an extremely low response rate. And given the importance of this and understanding, the, you know, the evaluation of this, what strategies do you have? Does a third party vendor have to make sure that you get a reasonable response rate? Excellent question. Uh, um, I don't know exactly what their strategies are, but I can certainly convey the importance of this. And I know that they feel that getting an adequate response is important to the credibility of their results. We had an initial provider survey a couple of years where I agree the response rate was very low. The evaluator does more like one to one sessions with certain groups within the network, which just naturally captures their attention a little bit better than an email blast. So they are using their own strategies to make sure that they're really getting good feedback and and dialogue with the participants of the network rather than just a you know survey fill out the answers because those are so easy to brush you off so i've seen improvements in the engagement amongst the provider network and i expect it to bear out in their latest evaluations here but i'll make sure that that is something that we really prioritize with the group of saying we want broad 
uh, responses and engagement in the results rather than just kind of a um, insufficient sample. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think considering carrots and sticks as incentive devices uh, are often important. Um, my, my next question was around the mental health screening policy. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's 70% screening rate for the second payment. And I was just curious, I cannot remember if, if you've told us this, but what is the experience now to date of the screening rates? I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of 70%. How close is that to where they are now? How much of a reach is that? We, we've seen a very broad spectrum of results from near 100 to near zero. And the first year, some of the challenge was uh, ensuring that everybody was reporting to us in a standardized way. Because this is a, a model where the participants report their own screening rates. They can do an agnostic of attribution, which I think is awesome. And they can do it right from their EMR system, which is also good because we don't ha always have the screening information in our claims feed. So um, my high level assessment is that there are a number of practices that are already above that that do really well. And there's a group in that middle of the the curve, so to speak, that has opportunity to improve and get up to the 70% screening rate. So I think it's a nice balance of those who are already doing well, probably don't need to do much else to get that good result. And there are some practices that need to figure out how to standardize this into their workflows, and they can pretty easily crest this threshold. What are, the, I mean, the barriers, I mean, a zero seems quite low. So I'm just wondering, what are the barriers to screening for mental health? I think some of that was probably data differences and how they capture the, those results. I, I don't really think zero is is 100% accurate. It's really how are they collecting their data, ensuring that they're tracking it and monitoring and um, standardizing that process so that as a system, we have good information on this practice and can encourage those who maybe aren't doing it as regularly or aren't capturing those data consistently to do so because it it does feel important to standardize this I and mean, i came from the mental health system so i'm personally a little bit passionate about this but um i think it's really good to have these data and then subsequent to that develop the protocols for the follow-ups for those who have positive screening results so i think this is really kind of developing the foundational best practices and i do think that with through this work we can really improve those screening rate results Okay, great. Thanks. And Abe, you had your hand raised there. So yeah, in, in addition to what Tom say, you know, anecdotally, um, some providers just um, either don't prioritize it in the time they have for a visit or don't, um, you know, don't feel appropriate asking that question. Like, you know, so we're trying to get to a standardized screening set. And as Tom said, then the next step is making sure we actually get it tracked and we're able to do it. But again, that's anecdotal, Jessica. Um, but um, I'm sure we've all been to a, a, a well care visit with our provider or an annual check in and not not gotten more than a passing glimpse of, hey, how are you feeling lately? And then just moving on from that topic for whatever reason. But I do think it's, you know, putting some focus on it and adding some standardization to it is is really trying to elevate it in, in importance. Uh, you asked that question of why would they not do it? I, I don't have the answer for that, but that's just um, kind of what we've experienced. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. Uh, my last question really is just a reminder of the five hospitals that are participating in the global payment program. Sure, it's the uh, UVM Health Network Hospitals in Vermont, so that's three of them. Rutland agreed to participate as well as uh, NVRH in St. Johnsbury. Okay, great, thank you very much. All right, why don't we, if, if you don't all mind, let's just take a, a 10 minute recess that will give Chair Foster a chance, he, he will be here for sure. And we'll just come back in 10 minutes and then I will open it up and, you know, Chair Foster will take over and then we'll hear from the HCA with questions and then public comment as well. So 10 minute recess. We'll be back at 10:15. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Okay, we'll resume our hearing of April 17th. Um, I apologize for my late arrival and thank Member Holmes for stepping in for me. Um, uh, I, I'm a, sorry, Mr. Foster, would you like to go back on the record? Oh, I'm sorry, Maggie. Yes, please. Okay. We are now back on the record. Uh, well, I apologize for coming uh, a little late to the hearing and thank Member Holmes for uh, conducting the hearing until I was able to arrive. <clears throat> I understand the board members have finished their questions and just mine um, remain. And so I'll get to those. Um, I only really had two topics I wanted to inquire about. 
Um, the first was um, the programmatic expenses and analysis of programmatic expenses. And if there was um, information we should understand as to why those weren't performed. Sure. Um, so the. Uh, sorry, just going back to the question I answered previously to make sure I'm consistent with this, but really what I articulated was one care has taken a lot of put a lot of effort into making sure that we operate in a uh, coordinated fashion, meaning that the finance team isn't doing work on its own. Value based care team isn't doing work on its own and that every initiative that we prop up and manage is done so in a collaborative fashion where there are contributions from finance folks, value-based care folks, uh, communications, uh, data and analytics. So really what it means is that every single initiative that we have is run through coordination across all these different departmental domains. And one of the challenges that I have from a budgetary and accounting and tracking standpoint is that every meeting, um, every trip that has mileage associated with it, et cetera, would need to be kind of tracked to say this person spent this much time on the mental health screening initiative, this much time working on the comprehensive payment reform program, et cetera. The other challenge is that often we have meetings with either within one care or with providers where multiple topics are discussed. So there could be a meeting with a, an FQHC and we talk about the mental health screening program, the population health model program, we're exploring an FQHC fixed payment initiative and all of these topics are covered because we have a you know meeting together in person and it would take a lot of dissection to peel that apart. And, and going backwards in time, I don't think it would be terribly reliable. And I, I, I am concerned that I'd be making a lot of guesstimates in terms of how much historical time and energy was spent on all of those initiatives. And um, I don't think that's a, a reliable source of information. Moving forward, we could do this, install a time tracking model and track every expense and break it apart. My concern there is it would be incredibly burdensome for all staff within the organization, uh, particularly the accounting team staff. And um, I'm concerned that the effort put into that kind of dissection of expenditures by initiative comes at the expense of work that we could be doing with our provider network. Can you describe the effort that's been done to um, allow one care to assess programmatic costs? Well, we, we don't really build a budget that way, candidly. We build a budget that assesses the needs of the organization, the teams that we need in place based on an assessment of historical work effort, uh, and then we prop up programs and initiatives that we believe the teams can manage uh, collectively as a, as a single unit. So we have not historically gone back in time and said, here's a, a guess of what any one initiative cost uh, for the reasons I expressed. But separating the historical, which is different than, than current, the, the board had an order for this, and I, I was trying to understand what efforts were made to be able to comply with that order. Uh, I'm not sure I fully follow your question. So the board ordered an assessment of programmatic costs. And I want to understand what efforts were made to be able to do that. Which budget order are you referencing? Just so I can read it really quickly. I believe it was in the final budget order from last December. Uh, Mr. Berman, go ahead. All right, so you're referencing the order that was issued in writing on the 29th of February? Yes, that's the, yes, I think that's the one. I don't have the date in front of me, but yes. Okay. Which specific number, just so I can read it? don't have it in front of me, so I apologize, but do you recall the board asking and requiring one care to assess the programmatic costs? I, I remember receiving a written communication asking to explain our rationale of why we don't build a budget this way, which we responded to. I'm not recalling a specific order to supply this information, but I could be mistaken, which is why I'm asking for the specific order number. I apologize, I don't have it in front of me. Um, let me ask it a different way. Can you describe any efforts that you have made at One Care to be able to assess the programmatic costs? Sure, we've done in the past, we've done time study exercises and 
universally, I think there's agreement top to bottom within the organization that it's a lot of administrative effort that bears little fruit relative to the way that we operate. So we've relied on that uh, information from the past without having to redo it again to know that it would be a, a tremendous administrative burden to start segmenting our business in a way that's incongruous with the way we operate. Okay, and since, since December of 2023, have there been any efforts to evaluate OneCare's ability to analyze programmatic costs? Which element of programmatic costs? The payments made to the network or other? OneCare's expenses in administering the programs. Not on a specific in a specific way for all the reasons I mentioned. And you said a couple of things, but the general gist of what I took away, and I'm not trying to minimize everything you said, but that there was a coordinated um, working environment where different departments are working on different programs kind of at, at the same time. Do you view that as an absolute bar to being able to assess the costs of any particular program? I don't believe anything is absolute in this world. And how do you assess whether or not a program is providing um, a return for Vermonters? I'm not sure how I define what the return for Vermonters is. Mr. Berman? I just have to say, Chair Foster, it feels like we're being prosecuted or questioned and trying to be cornered in. We asked which order specifically or we were referring to, and we don't know what that is. Um, we present a, a lot of uh, backup for the efforts that we provide in terms of value. So it, I'm just saying how we're feeling this line of questioning. Hey, I'm just trying to ask questions to help me assess the budget. So okay. one, of the cons one of the concerns we've had as a state and as a board relates to whether or not the programs are working and helping Vermonters. And there's a lot of costs to the programs. And I understand Mr. Boris's Boris's point that it's difficult to assess that. But if you're going to do a program, I would think that in an abundance of prudence, you'd want to know whether or not it is worth the money that you're putting into it. And so I'm just trying to understand how you do that. That's fair. We, I mean, we were asked to have an external consultant give us an evaluation of ROI. We provided the memo that that consultant generated based on that topic. I think we've done a very adequate job of trying to address all of the questions that were associated with the budget order. Um, I'm not sure where to go from there. I mean, we, I, I, if, if there's a desire that we track each individual program that we have and each effort that we have, um, it, it's just going to be costly and burdensome. I'm, I'm unsure of the value, but if that's that's the order, then you know we'll attempt to comply with that. Putting aside the order, you know, if when we do things at the care board, we want to make sure that we're putting our money and resources in a in a prudent way to what's going to work best. We're getting the most return of taxpayer dollars, and so I look at how we're allocating our time. I look at you know what we can do and how we can make improvement, what needs improvement. And I'm trying to just understand how One Care does that as to its investments in its programs. And it, I'm, I'm taking away, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm taking away that as to the programs that One Care runs, there isn't sort of a, is this working? Is it saving money? Is it worth the money we're putting into it? But there is a generalized, we did an ROI that the board required and we provided that to you. Is, is that a fair takeaway? I think it is. I mean, I think, um... There's a variety of things I do to maintain my own health. I can't attribute that going running once a week or eating healthier exactly has a value. Um, we we are in a contract with to administer a model for the state of Vermont. We're very very clear on what we do. There's a lot of things the board asks us to do along with that. Um, it's hard for us to parse out what individual effort that we have has value, or as you stated, return on investment. We actually had a bit of a discussion this prior to your arrival where we tried to describe, and, and I brought up, you know, 15 years ago, I did a lot of work around um, what's called TDABC or time-driven activity-based costing in healthcare. That was a big thing at the time to try to determine exactly how much it costs to do each activity as part of an effort to have higher value healthcare. It faded a little bit from prominence because it's so time intensive to do that doing it in any extensive manner doesn't provide a return on investment of even doing the work itself. So I guess 
what I'm saying is I think we do a pretty fair job of, of elaborating on the activities we do that derive value, but I, I don't know at what level your expectation is that we would go down to. I'm not trying to be combative, I'm just being honest. You, you're not being combative at all. Um, it's, a, it's an important dialogue, and I think for Vermont, it's important to understand. And all I'm trying to get is whether or not that's done and why or why not. And I, I think I understand the answer, so I, th I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the ROI analysis that was provided to the board, um, I've reviewed it. Was there any um, segmentation out for, for Vermont specific payers uh, as opposed to um, all payers? So there's Medicare, Medicaid, and then the commercial market. I think my memory is that it was just as to all payers, not as to Vermont payers. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. I mean, Tom, maybe I've, I haven't read it since it was first issued, so. I, I believe that's correct as well. As most of the work that we do, we, we try to make it as payer agnostic as possible and really so that the the providers that benefit from these programs have a, a uniform model and we're not saying, well, here's how much you did for one payer versus another. Do you have any sense or have you um, made any effort to analyze that as to uh, Vermont specific payers? We have not made attempts to segment that ROI analysis for any other investor now. Okay. Um, and the only other topic I had, and I apologize if this was touched on a little bit before I arrived, um, but the um, the reduction in the admin budget from um, late 2023, um, where was that money, where were those savings achieved? Can you say that a different way? I think the board ordered a reduction, if my memory is right, of $957,000. And I was asking where uh, those monies were uh, saved from. Well, we haven't concluded our fiscal year yet. So really, once the year is over, our full intent is to comply with the order and have our operating expenses come in at or below the cap set by the Screen Mountain Care Board. At that point in time, I'll be able to articulate exactly where we found those savings. And where are you budgeting and anticipating achieving them from? Uh, as discussed previously in this meeting, we did decided not to do a line by line uh, recast of this budget. We are capturing savings as we've been known to do historically throughout the year. And this is a strategy to avoid making big changes to the organization that would really harm our ability to support providers when there are some other organic uh, abilities to capture savings, such as a number of staff vacancies we've already experienced. So that your your plan and strategy to achieve those savings is as through as a year as the course of the year goes on, and there's some that you're planning on achieving from from vacancies, not replacing open positions. That will be a significant portion. Okay. Do you do you have a sense of what proportion you would anticipate? I don't at this point in time. I need to wait to, for the full fiscal year to conclude before making that statement. Yeah, Chair Foster, just to say we've had to, to the point of the vacancies, we've had you know a fair amount of attrition. Um, and I think some of that is attributed to the relative amount of um, lack of stability or clear future for what the ACO model is going to look like. Um, and we've been you know, trying to be financially prudent, looked very carefully at how we refill those positions and how we staff as we look at the sort of sunset of the all payer model towards the end of 2025. Um, just trying to be a good steward of our resources. So as Tom said, we 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 think we can manage the budget as we've done in the past. Um, and and you know we haven't taken specific efforts towards um, reductions at this point. Great. Um, that's all I had, and I appreciate your responses. Thank you. And again, I apologize for having missed the earlier segment. Um, if there's no follow up from board members, I will turn to the healthcare advocate. Good morning, uh, Sam Peich, health policy analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I just want to thank OneCare for the submission and also the questions and discussion from board staff and the board members. Most of everything has been covered. Um, I, I want to thank the staff, particularly Michelle, for, for the great questions. Many of, of hers overlapped with ours. And I guess I'll just say at a high level that we have some concerns about our interpretation of the level of compliance with the budget order. And I think some of the topics that have been discussed today um, 
relate to those concerns. And it, I, I guess I just also want to mention the attestation for PCP payments. I, I think that remains an outstanding item that's concerning to us. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll open up to public comment um, via the raise the hand function. Oh, sorry, Mr. Berman. Could could the uh, could Sam please elaborate on what the I had made a comment about our level of compliance. I'd just like to understand what the advocate feels we didn't comply with. Um, Mr. Peich, if you'd like to answer that, this is Ted. Yeah, well, I, I think we're still in the process of evaluating it. Um, I think the response around um, the attestation order about tracking primary care payments, I think if I'm, my memory serves, there was a a statement to the effect that this is subject to pending litigation. Um, but I think we're still wondering as to whether or not this is really compliant um, because it's a different budget order from a different year. Um, so that's, I mean, there are other elements as well. I think Chair Foster's points regarding the analysis of programmatic costs. I mean, I think every budget order that I've been familiar with at the end has a provision around or has language containing, you know, that one cares administrative expenses must exceed the health savings or must be less rather than the savings. And there must be an estimate of cost avoidance. And I, in my time, I've, I've never seen an analysis like that. And I think it's it's frustrating for Vermonters to consistently have this conversation around evaluating value and return on investment. And it feels like every year that I've been here, this conversation has has taken place. And I just there is there's virtue to attempting to do that. And I think it's frustrating when it doesn't seem like it's a meaningful attempt to do it. Appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Um and, and Mr. Berman, Mr. Boris, just I, I received a note as to the um the order I was referencing. It was um budget order condition number nine to the um revised budget order and Thank you. That was what I was referencing. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, how are you? I'm okay. Thank you. Um, the uh, uh, the can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, as <coughs> as I've said before, and I'm probably going to say again, there's this huge air of unreality here in this whole in this whole discussion. If you look at if you if you look at the history of what's going on here, the original purpose of an ACO is to set the stage for a way to get capitated financing to replace fee for service. Okay, that was that was the intent of the federal government. That's why the four stages were there where you started with fee for service and you ended up with capitation. That was Okay, the what you have is that neither, neither this board, nor the federal government, nor major payers like Blue Cross have had any interest in actually using one care for the purpose that it really exists and it would actually get you somewhere in making an effect on healthcare. The fact is that. If you, and so if you, if, if you, what you want to do now is if you don't want it, and I can't, and it's been out, it's been sitting out there for years. If you don't want um, to do Mr. Davis, let me, Mr. Davis, let me interrupt just because you're, you're crackling a little bit. It was okay, but it's getting difficult to catch all the words. I don't know if. I'm sorry. I don't, a way to... I, I don't know. How to deal. I barely can deal with a computer. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? I'm crackling. It's crackling Davis, a good amount. If you turn your camera off, you might have better luck. I I, I hope my camera is up. Wait a minute. Where's my camera? Wait, okay, wait a minute. Is it's my camera's off? That's Does better. That help? Yes, sir. That does okay. help. Okay. So so in other words, if you want to make the case, if you want to make the case that that you're not going to use one care. For the purpose for which it basically exists, then you might as well 
say so and say instead of just picking around the edge. And and the fact is that if you listen between listen to the lines and actually from the line that came out today, you weren't there for the time, Mr. Chair. You don't understand. The the reality the reality is that on the ground in the medical system, nobody has a clue what you're talking about. Nobody has a clue what one care is talking about. A, a. Berman, who's, who's going to do his best here, okay? They actually, these regional people that are supposed to, the regional that are supposed to be out raising awareness, okay? Guess what? There's no way to raise awareness. These people are working their butts off every day trying to deliver care and spending money just to say, Sort of very bureaucratic stuff about making everybody feel better. You should take that money, okay, and spend it on some healthcare people, mental health people, whatever, that can actually do some work. And so, all I'm saying, just it just doesn't it just doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. You've got the re, one of the reasons you've got a you one of the things you've got a, a reason you've got all of this back and forth with this. If I've never seen if I watched it been gone for six decades, I have never seen a blizzard of stuff like put, put but the Tom's put now. Well, why he's putting it out there is because you're demanding. And what you're saying, that's the issue. You gotta fix this, you gotta fix that. None of this is gonna work unless you use it to change the find the reimbursement system. And so straight ahead. You kill off one here. If this if it's not worth it, okay, if it's and, and the thing is that I I you know, the people in one care hard. But with the reason the reason why neither you nor the healthcare advocate nor Charlie Jones, the reason they can't find anything in there, okay, is because there isn't much. Get a grip. Re reality is reality. The doctors out there have no idea what the what the healthcare advocate thinks or what you think or what a Abe thinks or what Tom thinks or what I think. And it, they, they, they just, they're trying to just do the job. And somebody's going to decide pretty soon because, because what's is that not, not only is Abe not going to be able to, to uh, hire a bunch of new people to do some vague job, he's going to start losing the people he's already got. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other public comment? Okay. Um, Mr. Berman and Mr. Boris, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time today and for your responses. Have a good day. The next agenda item, which we'll turn straight to, is the 2025 All-Payer Model Extension Agreement, which will be presented by our Health Policy Project Director, Michelle Degree. Hi, Chair Foster. Give me just one moment. I am trying to connect to my phone audio. Apologies. No worries. Uh, Chair Foster, do yeah. we need the court reporter still? I don't think um, so. I don't think we do. Um, Ms. McCracken, we don't need the court reporter anymore, do we? Uh, no, I don't believe we need the court reporter anymore. Um, Maggie, you're welcome to hang out with us, um, but if you choose to go to other things, that's perfectly fine as well. So are we off the record, or will you need me again? In a little later. Um, we'll, we'll go off the record, and um, I don't think we'll need you later either. Okay. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day, and it was great working with you all. Thanks, Maggie. You too. Bye-bye. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. 
And can you all just confirm that you can see that? Looks good. Thank you. Okay, um, so as stated, we're here to talk about the 2025 proposed extension to the existing Vermont All Payer ACO model agreement. Um, that is the agreement between the state uh, signatories being chair of the board, secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and the governor, um, and CMMI. So I'm going to review. Um, a little bit of background with you. I've provided links here to all of the existing documentation. So we have the original agreement, as you all know, five-year term signed in uh, 2016. Original term of the agreement was 2018 to 2022. The first amended and restated agreement was a one year with an optional second year. So 2023 and our current year, 2024. And this proposed extension, um, which is technically amendment one to the first amended and restated uh, is for one year for uh, 2025. Um, the extension agreement itself retains the reporting requirements that force in the amended and restated agreement. Um, and there are proposed sort of administrative corrections to um, sections one, two, six, eight, nine, 12 and appendix one. Primarily, those are um, deadline related, right? So any formula that has to be updated with an additional year would then need to be amended um, and every December 31st, 2024 deadline would need to be extended to 2025. Um, so I, I will go through uh, the proposed sort of more substantive changes in a little bit more detail. So again, uh, updating the end date uh, to December 31st, 2025 throughout the agreement that includes throughout um, formulas. So thinking about um, total cost of care targets, all of those formulas have been updated. Um, these changes uh, on the slide here are reflected in section eight of the amendment. Um, I should also note, I had linked it on the prior slide, but it is available on our website under today's meeting. Um, so you can, you can click on that, it's uh, along with the slides. Um, so the more substantive changes, uh, the um, proposed amendment includes three new benefit enhancements for the Medicare beneficiaries participating in the program um, and requires the state to report on provider experience with those benefit enhancements over the life of the model. That report is designated to the Agency of Human Services. Um, it requires the board to use its regulatory authority should the ACO select an asymmetric risk arrangement in performance year eight, which would be 2025. And again, should the ACO elect for an asymmetric risk arrangement requires the board to report on initiative participant experience with uh, AIPBP payments in performance year eight. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about um, sort of those last three bullets there um, to give you a little bit more context. So first, we'll just touch on the benefit enhancements. Um, these are offered per the Vermont All Payer Model ACE, uh, Agreement. The ACO would have to choose to implement these. So they are outlined in the um, federal agreement, but the ACO still has to elect to implement these waivers. Um, so the the three new benefit enhancements that have been added are the home health homebound uh, benefit enhancement, the concurrent care for hospice beneficiaries benefit enhancement, and the conditions of payment for inpatient services, otherwise known as the CA 96 hour certification. Um, and additionally, there's sort of some expanded detail on the telehealth benefit. Um, as you may recall, um, telehealth um, was expanded during the public health emergency. So these expansions um, are through, per Congress through the end of 2024. The goal here is to continue to extend those into 2025, um, hence the expansion. So it's not technically a, a new waiver, it's just in a, a little bit of a tweak to an existing one to allow for some more time there. Um, the takeaway here for the telehealth one again is that it could expire at the end of 2024 um, and CMS recognized that the temporary extension of certain COVID-19 public health emergency flexibilities um, in accordance with all kinds of federal law um, would be set to expire and wanted to sort of continue those forward. 
Again, details of these benefit enhancements are found within the ACO's participation agreement with CMMI. So there's a mention of them in our federal agreement. The more detailed information gets taken and put into the, the participation agreement that the ACO or participating ACOs sign with CMMI. Asymmetric risk arrangement option. This is new. Um, so CMS approved a, a Vermont request to allow the ACO to elect uh, an asymmetric risk corridor. Um, so uh, asymmetric risk, obviously a higher upside than downside. So um, the proposed was a 6% upside and a 3% downside. Um, to support the goal of robust participation in the model during the final extension year of the model test. Um, as you're aware, the ACO has historically selected the lowest allowable risk corridor. Um, and while this has allowed them to minimize downside risk, it has limited their um, ability to, uh, it has limited the amount of shared savings that they have been able to um, receive. Uh, so having the option for a higher upside potential could allow them to receive a larger portion of savings. Um, and this change is really intended to create um, an environment that encourages the ACO to absorb the risk associated with the current Medicare AIPBP, all-inclusive population-based payment, um, which is ultimately reconciled back to fee-for-service. Um, so the goal here is to effectively create unreconciled payments at the provider level. So while the reconciliation processes would still happen between the ACO and CMMI, the goal is to not pass that risk on to providers. Um, facilitating more stable, predictable, unreconciled payments at the provider level at this proposed final model year could serve as an important stepping stone to a future model. Um, this may incentivize providers that have historically been unwilling to take on the risk that comes with AIPBP uh, to participate in the alternative payment model. It may also uh, better prepare providers for a head where should we be selected. Um, participating hospitals could be operating under hospital global budgets, which are not reconciled back to fee-for-service. Um, with these provider experiences in mind, if, ACO, if the ACO selects an asymmetric risk corridor, this is where the change comes for the board, <laughs> CMS would uh, require the Green Mountain Care Board to use its regulatory authority to direct the ACO to structure provider payments as to minimize annual recruitment of funds from providers in the absence of shared losses. I cannot emphasize enough that Asymmetric risk is an option. The ACO needs to elect this option. They can certainly elect a traditional risk corridor as they have done in the past and has been offered to them in the past. Um, this will be the participation agreement is sort of two parts between the ACO and CMS. I can't tell if anyone from the ACO is still on, so they can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but there's the agreement itself, which is kind of long and detailed, and then there's a separate risk selection form. Um, and so that piece is where they would be able to sort of make this change, right? And the AIPBP reconciliation piece that I'm discussing here is tied to the asymmetric risk component. So if the ACO were to elect just a traditional quarter as they have in the past, it would be sort of business as usual as we've done over the past six years. Um, oh, I just lost my mouse. There it is. Um, so as a reminder, AIPBP is reconciled with total Medicare fee-for-service fee, for fee reduction amounts. Um, so claims that were actually uh, reduced during the performance year. This happens two times currently. First, when there's about six months of run out, this is pretty typical. You hear board staff talk about this a lot. Um, six months of run out is usually what we aim for in all of our reporting. Um, so six months of run out from the performance year. Um, so that's usually around summertime, July or August of the year following the end of a performance year. Um, and then again at 18 months. So that's again, usually July or August of the following year. So if we're thinking about um, 2023 claims, so 2023, the year that just ended, 
we'll see a reconciliation in the summer of 2024, so in the next few months, and then we will see one again in the summer of 2025. I know that's a lot. <laughs> uh, and then um, just sort of a, I'll move through this quickly. So next steps here, as Susan mentioned at the beginning of the meeting today, there's a public comment period open through Friday, April 26th. Um, on these sort of proposed changes to the agreement. Um, there's a potential vote scheduled for Monday, April 29th. There's a, a board meeting that Monday. And then um, the fully executed amendment, so again, as I mentioned earlier, signed by all of the parties in Vermont, is uh, due back no later than Wednesday, May 8th. Um, so that's Chair Foster, Secretary Samuelson, and Governor Scott. Um, and so sort of running these processes in parallel with all of those other teams as well. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open to the other board members. I can go first again, if that's all right. Um, so, um, a few specific questions and then some general comments. Um, so Michelle, if we know from the hospital budget process and hearings that there's been a concerted effort to try to uh, improve clinical documentation in order to improve the case mix index. Um, is there, do I have audio problems going? Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to understand is with the claims run out that goes to 18 months, when will we start to understand the impact of these efforts on um, the potential for shared savings within the ACO arrangement? So if the effort was put in starting, um, I believe, like August of 2023, so that would run through 2024, we wouldn't, those Medicare claims would not finish their run out till summer 2025 in their reconciliation. So the sort of thinking of the reconciliation is two steps. So if something happened in August of 2023, that's only four months. <laughs> doing math uh, for of one year, right? Because we're talking about calendar years. So um, the it first reconciliation would be at that six month mark. And that's typically when we're talking about um, in this example, one cares sort of ACO process, they've seen then sort of their shared savings, their um, reconciliation amounts at that time. I, and if you'll recall, Lindsay and myself typically end up presenting on results from the prior year um, just before the ACO's um, budget presentation in the fall. So we we rely more heavily on the six month um, run out. So, you know, getting that information around July or August. Um, while claims do continue to be um, uh, reconciled through that next year, it's the the bulk of the changes typically occur within those first six months, um, but I hope that helps a little bit. The, the reason why I ask is I'm trying to understand the potential impact to shared savings on basically increasing um, appropriately clinical documentation, which leads to increasing billing. And if the ACO in this extension would be at risk to, while they've basically have walked away from significant savings in the past, if that dynamic could shift substantially and when we could start to get indicators of that shift. It's a really good question. I think um, I maybe don't have a incredibly straightforward answer for you, but also a reminder that not all hospitals participate in the Medicare program. So we're only talking about participating ACOs in, or, sorry, participating hospitals in this instance. Um, does that help at all? <laughs> I think that helps contextualize it, yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I think, like Dave, um, 
I don't have a, a straightforward answer. And I, I, while I appreciate what you're getting at, it's, I find it hard to imagine that there would be much impact in the, in 2025 because of the delay, right? And the, the, the time for the, the changes to encoding to take effect and then for payments to be made. Um, I would think if it has an impact, it, it wouldn't be particularly large. Um, but that's my gut because of the delay typically in things. Um, but to, to just to make sure that I understand the line of questioning, your concern is that the effort by the UVM health network to improve its coding to raise its case mix index, which was discussed during their budget cycle, that would increase reimbursement to the hospital, but could in fact push the ACO beyond its savings targets. So the effort by the health network would could harm its own ACO. That's my concern, yeah. That's your concern. Thanks for clarifying. I guess my, my general comment is that I think that evaluating the all-pair model agreement has been challenging. I think looking back at prior hearings, there's been some hesitancy to evaluate early in the agreement because of, I think, multiple reasons. One, it was rolling out. We were um, trying to implement uh, you know, the various programs. The programs have changed. The, the targets have changed. I think the purpose of it has changed from COVID, which was the big curveball in this whole thing. But now we're nearing, you know, the end of the all pair model agreement. And I, I really do think it would be incredibly helpful to put significant effort into evaluating what, um, what has occurred, what has worked, what is, what has not worked. Um, try and understand the impact of the benefits, like the blueprint sash funding. The CPR payments and and what the actual um, magnitude of our value-based care transformation infrastructure has been compared to, you know, and and this could be anecdotal even, but trying to understand that impact compared to other states who um, ended up in a different model with multiple ACOs and other value-based uh, contracting, and then trying to understand the impact of um, uh, of what has happened with commercial insurance through this period of time and the, and whether or not the all pair model uh, approach has had has been related to this significant increase in commercial insurance rates that has co-occurred. So um, I, I don't think that impacts whether or not um, you know the the question at hand today and the presentation today, and I think that, I feel supportive of moving forward with the signing the agreeing with the extension. I don't sign the extension, but agreeing to you know to support the extension. But but I think trying to really understand um, the impact of this model um, in a very quantitative but also qualitative way would be would be really important. Sure. So if I could just make one point, the um, the all payer model is evaluated federally through um, NORC, who is contracted with the with CMS. Um, we are expecting uh, around the same time every year. Uh, so in the next month or so, um, uh, the next federal evaluation. Um, I think at that point, if there are additional um, avenues that you'd like perhaps staff to explore, we, we obviously cannot direct um, NORC. Um, but if there are ad additional places you'd like staff to explore or for us to work on, you know, whether that means incorporating questions into the ACO's budget, I'm, I'm unsure, but like we can think about sort of more creative ways to get at some of the other points you're, you're asking about. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, I think that there's probably a bigger conversation about how to evaluate this model. I think the NORC report is one tool and one perspective that is really from the federal perspective, from CMMI's perspective. And I think in my reading, that's, you know, the, the money that 
is saved there is money saved by Medicare. I think we need to think about it from the state's perspective and Vermonters' perspective, which I think is a quite different perspective than the, than the NORC report. Um, and I, it's taken me some time to understand that difference, but I think that's a really valuable um, different perspective to evaluate the program. So NRSC report's not particularly concerned about Vermont commercial insurance. Um, they're not concerned about Medicaid particularly. That's a Medicare focused evaluation. And I, I am supportive of appropriate use of resources, um, federal or state, but I also think that um, that I think there's, you know, I think that it's very important to think about how that, uh, that this model's impacted the state in other ways than just from the federal perspective. Uh, Dave, if I could um, just for a second respond to one um, comment that you made about um, whether the all payer model has, um, I don't know if you use the exact word caused or not, but um, been associated with increases in commercial prices. Um, there's certainly been an association in Vermont while the all payer model has been in place. Commercial prices have risen faster in Vermont than most other places in the country. Um, what we've seen around the country from a health policy perspective is that that's happened a lot. Nobody's designed a study to look for pure academic causation, but places that have participated in accountable care organizations, particularly large ones, have seen an increase in consolidation among their hospitals within their regions and the regions with more consolidation. Those consolidated entities raise prices to commercial payers faster than they were before consolidation. So there's an association that's consistent in many places that these type of agreements lead to increased prices for commercial payers. Thanks for that comment. I, I have no other questions for today, but thanks Michelle for the presentation. Michelle, um, do you have a sense of where I think we have from prior conversations, but it helped me to hear again today. Um, if we declined to extend this agreement, what would we lose? The ACO would go away, right? but what else would happen in Vermont? Sure, so I think, you know, one of the biggest ones we always point to is that the federal agreement is the avenue by which we receive funding, Medicare portion of blueprint funds and SASH funding in the state. So that would effectively be gone. Um, I think, you know, there, this is the state's agreement. It still does require the ACO to have that participation agreement. Um, so that they're sort of Two separate, two separate things. Um, but the state agreement is the avenue by which we receive blueprint and stash funding. So I think that's sort of one of the biggest ones that gets that gets highlighted. Um, you know, I think in the absence of, um, yeah, that's. I, I'll just say that's one of the the biggest we're, things that we that we see. We're we're nearing the end of my my second year on the on the board, and so. Um, or just, I'm sorry, into the into the beginning of the third. So I don't have the long history, but were Blueprint and SASH around before the all-payer model? Yes. Yeah. How were they funded then, do you know? I could not speak to that wholly. Um, I will say the the Blueprint, this is the medic a Medicare component of Blueprint. So it's not, it's not full Blueprint funding. You know, other payers are, are providing their um, share. Um, so the, I can uh, also provide that information when you're finished. Yeah, oh. I was going to I was going to ask Thanks. if Robin could Thanks, Robin. jump in. <laughs> do you want me to go now or do you want to finish? Tom, I don't want to interrupt you. No, I was I, I was hoping you might if any help. I'd like help sure. understanding that because I've sure. I've been under the impression previously that um, if 
the if the all payer model were to end or the ACO were to end, that blueprint and SASH funding would go away. And my impression up until recently had been that it would all go away. But now I'm questioning that. So um, yeah. if you could help, that'd be great. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the, the blueprint and SASH dollars that come through the all pair model, as Michelle said, are the Medicare contribution to blueprint and the majority of the SASH dollars. There's a small component of administrative dollars that come through the state budget through Dale to, um, to SASH, but the vast majority of SASH's funding is through this vehicle because they're majority Medicare, right? So they don't, you know, they're it's kind of tied to their patient population, which is over 65, and so thus is funded by Medicare. Prior to the all pair model, the state had participated in the, the Medicare MAPCP, which I won't remember exactly what that acronym stands for, but it was a prior federal model to provide um, funding to for primary care practices to have a Medicare contribution for and become a medical home. And the state was able to negotiate, including not just the PMPM PM to the practices, but also the dollars that go to the community health team and SASH through that federal agreement. So it, it started in a prior federal agreement. The Fed stopped that program. We moved into the APM and were able to continue that funding stream through the new agreement. Um, and um, so Maybe that's all I have to say about that. So that's so it's basically been an, an MAPCP federal agreement with the state and Medicare transitioned to APM. Okay. Um, thank you. And so the APM two, which we're we're talking about, would be a way of extending that agreement further. Is that right? Yes. So the okay. yes. So the federal government has been open to continuing these contributions towards Blueprint and SASH because we've had a continuous period of time of federal agreements, even though we've transitioned from one type of agreement to another type of agreement to potentially a third type of agreement. So the continuity of time is actually an important element. Um, not just for Blueprint and SASH, but also for any other uh, sort of Medicare savings that we might want to argue for in the future, um, there, because there's. Sorry, I'm almost done. <laughs> that's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> because I, 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 and there's there is a history or precedent in other states, particularly Maryland, of the feds being willing to sort of continue seeing it as a continuation of an agreement, even though it's a new model. I see. Are there other models other than the all payer model too that? Um, could afford this opportunity of continuing blueprint and SASH funding? No, the feds have been clear that um, the only vehicle for a state agreement is uh, the AHEAD model in the future. Uh, there are other Medicare programs. They would not come with the additional funding for blueprint and SASH. Okay. Um, the the that, other thing I just wanted to mention um, is that I, I I don't agree that if we don't have an all pair model that the ACO goes away. What goes away is the Medicare Next Vermont Medicare Next Generation ACO program. The ACO could choose to participate in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is open to ACOs around the country. So mm -hmm. there is a so it's not a, even though we think of them, I think together, they could choose to do a different program mm -hmm. um, if, if, if this one wasn't if, available. If they chose to do a different program, that would not solve the problem of continuing funding for Blueprint and SASH. I was Correct. speaking specifically to if we did not have an agreement in 2025, the ACO wouldn't go away because there's another option, or they might. I don't know what they would do, but there is yeah. another option for them rather yeah. than going away. Do, do, do either or, or anybody else have a sense of how 
how much funding Blueprint and SASH receive as part of the program? Uh, so it's trended with the benchmark. So last year it was almost $10 million. Um, at the beginning of the agreement, uh, in, you know, 2016, I think it started at seven and a half million and it's been trended forward at the benchmark rate ever since. So it was it was just under 10 million last year. I would imagine we would push that threshold for 2025, just if I'm thinking about math correctly. <laughs> yeah. And how, what's been the trend in One Care's budget during that time? What's it cost One Care to run? I would have to look that up. I, that's not something I have off the top of my head. It's not a very sophisticated analysis, right? But um, it seems like we're 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 spending bad money in order to try to get some potentially good money for programs that, while not studied in great detail, Blueprint and Sash do seem to offer some benefit directly to Vermonters. And as Dave was pointing out, uh, the all payer model and, and one care, um, they've offered some benefit to Medicare because less money has been spent in the state on patients who have Medicare for their insurance. So you know, currently, like, I'm really trying to understand this because Currently, I'm not inclined to want to extend an additional year. I feel like this experiment has run its course. So we have a chronically underperforming entity with one care. And there's been some success from Medicare standpoint, but not it hasn't delivered for Vermonters. Um, and in addition, it, it, one okay. in, in addition, it seems to have the organization has delayed or in some cases failed in my one one board member's opinion to comply with our orders and the orders have been meant to help us get a better sense of how they're performing and ultimately that would help them prioritize where their spending is occurring um so it, it's I don't feel that Vermonters have benefited from this model. And I believe the organization has not um, complied with the orders that are requested, which those two things combined make it difficult for me to see how they would do better in one year remaining. And to continue to improve, to continue to improve their budget, and to continue to extend this agreement, to my reading, seems wasteful for Vermonters. I just want to clarify that Blueprint and Sash have been evaluated, um, and I can get those evaluations to you if you'd like to see them. Um, pretty significantly, um, and I believe we're part of the the sort of reason that we were able to continue moving them into the this model. Um, so I just have, uh, I'll say a couple quick things. Um, I think there's no shortage of like frustration kind of state large relating to some of these issues with the first all payer model. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't a good model and it doesn't mean that it wasn't a really good idea. There's many reasons why good ideas don't come to fruition as you hope. And there's expectations and some realistic hopes and expectations and some that aren't. And there's a lot of frustration, I get that. Um, I think that Member Walsh and Dr. Merman's points are, are fair. It is concerning to me that there hasn't been um, a Vermont evaluation, right? Um, that would help make it an easier decision to, to go forward. And I can understand I'm sympathetic to the view that we're spending a lot of money and the real crux of the benefit is the blueprint and sash money. That blueprint and sash money is very, very critical and very, very important. 
And the CPR money is very important to keeping the primary care providers stable at this time when we really, really need them. Um, but I think there is an argument that perhaps what we're paying is more than what we're getting. <clears throat> but it's frustrating that we don't actually know that um, to the degree to which we would like. Nonetheless, while I recognize all of those issues, and I think that they're fair issues and good questions, um, I will be inclined to vote for this and to support an extension. And the, the reason for that really is um, a concern from the provider perspective of disruption. And it'd be a very, very large change very, very suddenly. And I do think that, you know, a sudden change without the blueprint or, or SASH money being allocated for would be problematic for the state. So we might be paying more than we should, and we might be paying more than we want. And we should have had a plan from the start that there would be an independent Vermont evaluation there isn't, and that's a fair concern. Um, but I think given where we are, I will be supportive of the extension. Um, and I don't know if one care is still on. Um, Mr. Berman or Mr. Boris, are you guys still here by chance? Maybe not. Well, I was going to ask, and the one thing I was concerned about is like what 2024 looks like from the ACO's perspective. So in 2023, we know that there's potential losses, um, I think potentially even large losses, and I think that 2024 might be even harder. So in addition to the cost, we might be experiencing losses that may need to be paid back. Um, and maybe that's part of what's feeding into the challenges with this a little bit. So the ACO will really have to perform given some of the changes at the UVM Health Network and how they're uh, billing and how they're dealing with the patient acuity issue that they flagged themselves. So savings will be tough this year. And I kind of want to see where they were and what they thought, but we can ask them that offline. In any event, that's all to say that I recognize the frustrations, they're fair, um, but personally for me, I'll be supporting this. I thought I'd just jump in with a few comments as well. I don't have any questions. Um, I would say that for me, the 2025 extension is less about the ACO and more about um, potentially thinking about how providers can start preparing for the next model, if there is a next model. Obviously, we won't know that for another year. Um, but for example, uh, one of the benefits to providers currently through this agreement is the ability to not come into compliance with MIPS, Medicare MIPS. Medicare is a very different place than it was when Vermont joined the Alpair model. I think providers need time to prepare for that. Um, it will potentially involve changes to EMRs and electronic health systems. So I see 2025 as providing a glide path um, for providers to think about what's in the future. So in addition to the disruption potentially of Blueprint and SASH, I think there's additional disruption that uh, in the provider community that could be avoided by being clear that you know 2025 should be a glide path year. That is in part why the state uh, requested and negotiated additional um, waivers that potentially could be um, implemented. You'll may have noticed that all of the waivers that are new to 2025 are waivers that would be included in the AHEAD model. That allows providers to potentially implement those waivers in advance of a participa participation in AHEAD if we end up there. Um, so I, I really see 2025 as a transition year, a closeout year for the APM, and a year for people to start looking forward and thinking about 2026 and what that might bring and how we can um, hopefully continue to move forward in improving our health system. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say. I will be supporting the uh, extension, which is probably obvious from my comments. Thanks. Okay, 
Um, seeing no other board comment at this time, um, I will open it up to the healthcare advocate. Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, we're still reviewing it uh, within our team. Uh, I just so at this time, I just want to thank Michelle for all the work and for the board for posting it on the website. Um, and thanks for the conversation today. Thank you. And I'll open it up to public comment. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just a, just a couple of points. Um, one of them is that the that, that I believe that it's really difficult the whole question of risk, and then how you're trying to incent, use money to incentivize the medical system, doctors from the medical authorities just generally to increase quality to do to do just to do just better work. I did. I just can't believe any. Of that. I think the only way that you can really incentivize people to do something differently is, is if they can see how what they're doing is affects what they're getting paid. What the do and uh, this is a I think this is a I can't I don't remember exactly, but I, one cares has some has had a tendency in the past to do, to dilute that by trying to lump stuff together. The minute you lump stuff together, the the whole incentive to improve the quality vanishes. And somebody else to sort to get the numbers, the, the numbers looking the way they should. So I would just I would just say that if you're that the that if you that the whole uh, the whole risk idea, the whole risk idea is just plain doesn't doesn't work because it's because it's not in the, not individualized. Uh, the second thing I want to do, the second point I want to make is something that's I'm very troubled by. And, and, and one of the reasons I'm raising this is that I'm writing a book about it. And it's a principle of journalistic, the journalistic profession of which I consider myself a member and have been for many years, is that if you talk about somebody, then you, you tell them that and you give them a chance to respond. So here is a, what I think is one of the most important points that I've seen. Both Tom Wong and Jessica Holmes in an interview with her local newspaper have said that the Vermont costs are going up too high, okay, because there's too much consolidation. And when they say the word consolidation, they use that UV network, okay, that they, that, that 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 has been that that is a problem and that's one of the reasons why the Vermont increases in costs are too high. Okay, this this, this is wildly mis for the following reason. Here it is, and anybody wants to argue with it, bring it on. The fact is that there are two numbers about what you, what Vermont is spent. One is the gross one is the, the gross number. Okay, of what they spend to keep their people healthy and safe. Okay, that number is relatively high. It's very high. It, it, it's relatively high. And here's the reason it's relatively high. Because there are 50 states in the United States. Everybody will agree to that. And the only state that's older than Vermont is Maine. Vermont is the second oldest state in the United States. Any, even the people who don't know anything about health are gonna understand that the more that the older people get, the more they use the healthcare system. And so the question is not, so the, so the two questions about Vermont cost, and when you look at them, the question is, are they age adjusted? If you look at the Dartmouth Health, the Dartmouth Health app is gonna tell you that Vermont costs are very low because they're age adjusted, okay? now. If you if you take the raw data, the raw data, then the, then the cost then the cost are okay. Now the, the, the referee here, that's just not my opinion. The the, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation looks at this, and I've talked. Okay, the they what they do is they they they're saying that the Vermont cost. Are, okay, but what they what they also they have not proven this. I have not. The holy check, but they indicated that their data is not age adjusted. And what you've got is so you're saying so Walsh and Holmes are saying stuff like we have this, and they don't have to say UVM. Everybody knows that everything is tiny in Vermont except the University. 
health net from on health net. What they're not what the fact of the matter is that in it, the consolidation, uh, all the research shows that from all, from all across the country, the constant consolidation is in the, in the healthcare system is raising prices because the bigger integrated system has more economic power than the little guys. That's true. But guess what? It's not true in Vermont, and you guys know. And here's why. Here's an hard example. You just approved in August of 2024 year budget for the health network and you allowed them to get like I can't remember the exact numbers, but 10, 12 percent increase in their net patient revenue. Terrific. Sounds really good. Except then what you did was in addition to that, you forbade them asked to, to go to the insurance industry, which is the only place you can get new money. The only place. And what you gave them okay, so here's what I want to know. And so, and uh, and I, I sent I sent this this question to Holmes, and now I'm asking this home because to uh, Walt because I, he's the only this is the only one I get to him. Where's the muscle there? Yeah, show me how UVMMC. Okay, it's got a lot of muscle on this thing. When they when they when they said they needed 12 percent, perfect. Your job is to judge whether that's whether that means that. But you granted 12 and you gave them three. Tell me what the value to them is for getting 12. The idea that they can just fiddle something around, change their, that is just garbage. Anyway, that, so that's my comment. Thank you. Mr. Davis, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions. Um, your comment about the, the first comment, um, in your view, the risk isn't having the impact we would expect because it's too... Uh, diffuse from the providers. They're not recognizing it individually because it's not impacting them. Um, and I was just going to ask if you were going to be on our hearing this afternoon at two relating to global budgets, because I'd like to hear your perspectives on that if you're able to attend. I know you generally attend. Um, oh, you should never have said that. You want my opinion? I, well, I'll be there. Yes, sir. The, the answer. The answer to that is yes. Yeah, I know I like all the public comments and opinions. So yeah, definitely, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And then the question on age adjusted, you said, I think we're actually the third oldest state, not the second. And the other New England states, I think I think Mass is 17th, Rhode Island's like ninth. They're, they're all generally pretty old in New England. Um, you said age adjusted would mean that, you know, older people need more care. Do you see that in the utilization data and access data we have in Vermont that our Vermonters are getting more care because of the age? The, the of, of course. I mean, that's an, it's, to, it's totally in the data. And the thing is that this this whole system, Mr. Chairman, was started in Vermont by a guy named Jack Weinberg in the 19, early mid 1970s. Okay, and I I looked at that. I did a two and a half hour documentary on it that from national. It, the, 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 the question is, the question is that the, is, is the a medical practice patterns, okay? Uh, did they, are the variations, uh, are the variations justified? And Wenberg's work, and, all, and not only Wenberg's work, the 2009, everybody should read it, 17 printed pages. A tool go on a piece in New York in the New Yorker in the New Yorker magazine in 2000, 2000 and just juxtaposes the kind of medical care that is delivered in Homestead County, Minnesota. The lowest cap in the United States is by Mayo Clinic. And, the, and when, when you when it's your life on the line, Mayo Clinic, your last stop. The next stop is the town. And so, in any event, that's in that that's, in the, 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 that's what, in the, and so what you get so the so when UPM comes in, argue to you that we're, we're the best class in the United States, okay? And then somebody else and it says you're the highest class in the United States. The difference in those two numbers are real. It's not that they that they don't exist. The thing is, the whole question in utilization is a adjustment. If you look at if you if you want to look at if you want to look if you want to compare Rutland County 
the, the utilization patterns in you in Rutland County compared to the utilization patterns in Kenton County. Okay, then what you'll find what you'll find is that what you'll find is that the universe on individual prices are going to be higher. Now, how part of that is because of all of the they deliver tertiary care in Rutland. But the reality, if you look at the the cost per capita, the cost per capita in Chittenden County is a full third to a half below the cost per capita in Rutland County. And if you did that, you adjusted that, raw would be larger. Check it out. And so if, so two questions on that. So one, you said we're getting more expensive because we're getting older, but has our age in Vermont increased over the last 10, 20 years, or have we always been an old state? Well, we've always been a relatively old state, but we're getting older. And so what we're happening is if you look at the whole state, county by county, okay, um, the low, the, some counties are getting older faster, okay? Sure. And, and, but so Chittenden County, which is the, is 25% of the entire population. It's 25% of everything, okay? And so if you just, if you just look at that, okay, that, and I compared, for example, I have compared, I've actually done this computation, Mr. Jim. It's people say, what's the price of an MRI? And some, but let's say it's thousand bucks. There's an MRI, you're gonna get a thousand. Okay, what is the MRI in Chittenden and in UVM? And what is the MRI at some other hospital, okay? The UVM hospital will be higher cost from MRI. But then look at the incident. The practice pattern in RUP to use MRI is twice what it is in Chittenden County. Okay, if you think that doesn't happen, then all you have to do is do eighth grade arithmetic and you will get you will get hammered handily, okay, by going to Rutland. So as we age, we get more expensive. That makes sense to me. And as we age, we should see higher utilization. So Vermont's one of the more expensive states for healthcare because we're old. We should also see a correlation where Vermont has some of the highest utilization in the country. The 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 it depends. The, the Vermont is not a monolith in medical in the medical system. If you look, this data is all owned by you. This is all in all that October 27, 2021 data. It's 400 pages, okay? And I printed, I printed the relevant, all of them. Okay, so the reality is, you, you the Vermont, the Vermont is, Vermont is old, is getting older, okay? It's, but, and now I, I would, I don't know whether, I think it, my data shows that it's second old, it may, but it's very old. And, it's not, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's getting somewhat older, but it's been old. It's all been old for 30 years. It's old, it was older and was older in 20 when I started looking at 1980 and it's still old. And so, so the question is really, the question is really, you know, how you look at that. And you know, you shouldn't believe me. I, you, you got our guys, I, what I have to say, but go look at your own data. You've got three, got three coming at the quality issues. You've got PQI. You've got mathematical stuff coming in there. You've got, uh, uh, you've got the, the uh, uh, this. Just look at all of those. Problems. Here's what they're going to tell you: We have 154 beds more than we need in Vermont, so that the performance of the M Health Network, okay, compared to the not the 11 hospitals in the non-UVM world, that, is, that difference, okay, is the size of the Grand Canyon. And the problem is that the, that, that UVM is held in such terrible regard, significant, as I've written, by their own fault, okay? But the, 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 the what they are is a huge target. So, so you weren't there, UVM, but you would have had a great time today the, the, this board was meeting in a room ten in the house, and the door bursts open, 
and in comes a 15 guys in gray t-shirts from some, from, you know, organization, jumping all over the room and you, you can't take the green, you cannot take the, the Blue Cross premium rate up because nobody can afford it. Well, okay, so if so, you tell me, how, I can't, how easy is it to take money away from UVM compared how much money you take. You've got three hospitals that completely fail their hospital tests, and it's all in there. You, you look at places like Rutland, Bennington, Gifford, Northwest, Northeast, and when you look at the quality at the numbers, there, you are not. That's not my like Although I've been in every hospital in this state many times. Plus, in hospitals, one into this other. The, these, these Really, 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 their political dynamite. Anyway, that I get raved enough. I'm sorry about that. I get, I get a little steamed up. No, it's I'm, I enjoy. I'm asking you because I appreciate your views. Um, when you say UVM is a third cheaper, are are you referring to Medicare data or what data are you referring yeah. to? Yeah, and so and so, Mr. Walsh will tell you, oh, the Medicare data doesn't differ. You can believe that if you want. I don't. The UVM, if, and, and, he, and here's what I ask Mr. Mer, Dr. Merman, when, he, when people come in with his, his, his ER, okay, does he treat them differently depending on who their payer is? How about that? Pay them different? He treat them differently? I'm, I'm happy to address okay. that. I, I uh, no, and I've never worked at any hospital emergency department that would treat patients differently based on their pair, nor have I um, spoken with a colleague at any place in the country that would treat their patients differently depending on their pair in the emergency department. So um, I'm really it. appreciative of the federal law of the EMTALA Act in 92 that codified that into federal law. And it actually really focused the profession of emergency medicine. So that's what, it. What, okay, Clear so state. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ch just listen to what Merman just said. That's why, that is why you can, that is why you can comfortably use the, the Dartmouth Health Atlas data because it's Medicare based, but it, it, it there's this, but his the people, the, doc, the doctors, there may be a few, but most doctors, care about their patients, okay? And whatever they think is right, okay, that's what they're doing. And they're not changing what, what Mr. Walsh has told us in the past is that they are. That's why he says, yo, you can't count on the Dartmouth Health Act. Right? So, right? In my time at the board, there's been a good amount of talk of the cost shift. Um, and I, you know, there's various views on that. I know it's a topic that people get, have strong views about. Um, I'm curious if you agree there's a cost shift. I think you'd said in the past there isn't because there's a regulatory structure. No, 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 um, no, no, but, no. Excuse me. No, I have. There's no the cost shift. Tom, Tom Pelham used to think this. It's it. There's no way to avoid the cost shift. The cost shift is inevitable if Medicare and Medicaid are not paying the full price. You say if the the actual cost of the entity the doctor in the hospital to deliver the care. Cost is what the cost is. The question then is, how do you recover those costs? And, the, and there's no way to recover the cost without the cost shift. And that's why, why it's so critical what you guys have to say about the commercial app. The driver right. of the cost system is the commercial app, it's not the EPR. And so when you get in there and you, so, so absolutely, and so, 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 I mean, this is God. It's the, the the there is no the idea that you can align that the, and and the com, many commentators that actually I think don't know what they're talking about. They we have to align these costs, okay, so that we shouldn't have a cost shift. Let's make the cost shift go away. That's like saying we should make cancer go away. No, we should make cancer go away, but. How going to do it. There's, I, there's no way no, at, at all in, in the current system. In the current system, no way to avoid the cost. 
And the only question so, so let me let me let me interrupt because I want to understand one particular thing from your viewpoint. Yeah. UVM is a third cheaper, but that's on Medicare. Do you yeah. have a view as to if UVM is cheaper for Medicaid or commercial? No, the the, 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 the Medicaid and commercial. Uh, no, Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicare pay what they want to pay. But the, right. neither but you, one you of said them said UVM is a third price. cheaper, and I want to understand if they're a third cheaper as well for commercial yeah. or for yeah. Medicaid. Or if you're no, they're not a third cheaper on Medicare. But the, the thing is that neither Medicare, Medicare pays much better than Medicaid. Okay, but it, and that's changed over time. It, the, the delta used to be tremendous. I mean, the cost, the shortfall of Medicare and, and Medicaid is terrible. The reason, the reason why it's so desperately important. If the one care or somebody continues to pour, get the money into the, uh, the primary care community in Vermont, that if you're a primary care doc, you're already living in nuts and berries compared to orthopedic surgery. And if all you, if too many patients are medical, you can't go there. And that's that, that you can't even do it. So, so, it, so, okay, so. The, so, and one of the things you can do is you can say the Vermont land people have said this. They've said in the Vermont legislature, uh, you need to increase Medicaid. What that would do is, you, if, if the legislature would increase Medicaid pay, the pressure on Yuga to keep Blue Cross rates down would decrease. Okay. The question, the problem is, Vermont is a tiny frozen state with half a million people. They, they they don't have enough, not enough money for anything, whether it's hospitals or schools or, or fixed lake champlain or anything else. It, this is really hard. I mean, that's my opinion. It's really, really hard. And I and 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 I worked from every I was a regulator. I was also in the legislature. I mean, I've I I I, I, I ran health for Madeline Kill. The thing this is your problem. Hard and you can. It's hard enough if you look at the whole system. But you guys, what you guys have chosen to do is not look at, not look at that ocean of data. It's going to tell you that is that your biggest problems lie outside the UVM network. Okay, and the political cost of doing that is really high. I, I'll just share a quick observation. I, I think the political optics of any of it's really hard, whether it's small hospital, UVM, ACO, all the politics are always tough from my vantage point. But I, I, I want to focus on that question. You, I mean, you've made this point before about UVM being cheaper. Is UVM cheaper for commercial as compared to the other hospitals? Oh, absolutely. Because they, the care, because their cost performance on a per capita basis is the same in for commercial as it is for Medicare. They, uh, for Medi is it, for commercial and for Medicare and Medicare. The uh, you get a you get a cardiothoracic surgeon. You get a got an orthopedic guy deciding whether to do disc operation. What you do, you get some kind of problem, difficulty that you need a trauma one set. All of that kind of stuff is all of that kind of stuff is subject to uh, utilization variation in medical pattern okay. and the question is do do does the doctors in the system do the doctors in the system have an incentive a huge financial incentive to order every test every metric every do every case if you want to get a hip replacement at Dartmouth you want to get a hip replacement at UBM if you want to get Placement at Copley, okay, which is a box one. If you want, okay, what you, you, then you're looking at six. And the reason they're going to look at, they're going to take a look at that. Now, if you call up a small hospital in Vermont, okay, and say that you want a hip replacement, you call up Springfield, you call up Gifford. Yeah, go ahead, try it, okay. You could lie, you know, call them up. I, got, I need a hip replacement. Can you do that? What they'll tell you is Tuesday. If you think that doesn't work, we've got we've got 50 years in the United States. Our cost 
the third the higher than the, in the rest of the world, not an act. That's the, there's a reason for that. See. So the per capita, the, on a per capita basis, UVM would be cheaper commercially. Is that age adjusted to for Chittenden County being the youngest county in the state? Absolutely, and that's why that's why Jack Weinberg's work, which started in Vermont, went moved to New Hampshire. Now for, is in for, for, in for commercial. Sorry, sorry, sir, for commercial. It's all, a, it's in, in, in the dark health atlas is really now good. I mean, it is really, and not it's not only age adjusted. It's sex adjusted, payment adjusted, it's hair color adjusted, it's adjusted out to the eyeball. And the reason is that if you don't adjust, okay, then you can't really get at the question of what's going on. So I'll just ask you if you if you wouldn't mind, if I don't, I don't want to impose on your time, but if you wouldn't mind sending my um assistant Kristen your data, I'd love to see it relating to UVM's commercial um costs being cheaper um, on a per capita age adjusted basis. I'm not sure I'm familiar exactly with the data you're talking about. So if you'd send it to her, I'd take a look and appreciate it. The other question I had is you talked about consolidation a little bit. And um, <clears throat> have you seen the costs and the commercial prices for the network decrease as consolidation has occurred here? The, uh, absolutely, Central Vermont. Now the thing is that, but, it, but the, the, the real real effect has not been that great an effect. Uh, Middlebury has only been in the Vermont in the UVM health network since the late teens. that that's when they just they just when Porter just ran out of gas and gave themselves to UVM. They have yet they, and it's not like, one of the things I'm not sure I, I'm not saying that UVM is perfect. I mean people may think they think anything I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that UVM has huge problems internally. One of the things that one of the things if you watch and you do watch, you do watch. Look, think of the thing you, just, what you should look at it on the look at look at what what they look at what 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 um, happened this morning this morning. Okay, Tom Bory here and he gives you this. I couldn't begin. Nobody in the world does that stuff. There's this, that, the other thing. There's, there's numbers all over the place. But what really happened? Then, then Abe comes in. Abe is brand new. He just got named real head, the real head on care, like three days ago. Oh, whatever. He's looking. He's looking at the real world. What he can see is. What you can see is the kind of stuff that they that UVM, I mean that there has is ginning up. I, I understand that's a pejorative word, but I don't care. I'm calling it ginning up. Okay. It's well, we'll make this guy, we'll try to do this, and we'll make these guys be more of that or of this, and, we'll lay, and then oh, and we'll try to find out and we'll encourage some people to take the bus or whatever. Okay. What 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 Abe, what Abe what Abe told the board today this morning okay was, hey, it's really tough. They've got this whole idea of people that make you feel better, okay. And then what what are you going to have to pay a guy to make you feel better? Okay, if you're a primary care doc, which you can earn in the market, okay. What you if it, you're if you're a primary care doc and you're in a and you in an in a independent market where you get a I Medicaid. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Davis. I'm gonna I'm gonna just interrupt um because I, I see a couple of hands raised, but I wanted to um sorry. make this no 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 it's okay. I didn't ask a great question. So you talked about consolidation and how it's saved money for Vermonters here. And if you if you have the data, so I, I asked that because I asked that of UVM Health Network in their hearing, um, if they have uh, evidence that the consolidation has decreased prices, uh commercial prices for the network. Um, and if I recall correctly, I don't think they had it. So I, that is something I'm interested in and in looking at because if consolidation is saving us commercial money and in enhancing quality, um, we definitely want to know that. So if you could send that as well, if you have it handy, how the consolidation at the network has decreased prices, I would greatly appreciate it because that's something we do want to understand. And admittedly, we don't perfectly understand it. 
Um, I see Member Walsh has his hand raised, and then I'll go to Member Holmes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Ham, for years of of dedication and insight into trying to make healthcare better in Vermont. Um, I do want to respond to a couple things that I think were factually incorrect that that you not incorrect. You were correct, but um, not current up to date. Right. The El Paso McAllen analysis by Atul Gawande you mentioned specifically. I think that came out around 2009. Um, and that that found, as you pointed out, that among Medicare recipients, McAllen was more than twice as expensive as El Paso. There was a redo of that article. I think it was by Franzini or an Italian name. I'm pretty sure it was Franzini a year later in 2010 that found that that was not the case for people who were less than 65. There's a difference between the costs of care for patients with Medicare and patients with private pay. That Franzini article kind of cracked the shell on what Dartmouth had been talking about all the years before, all the years I've been teaching there. That was followed up by a large project in Yale by Zach Cooper's team. The first publication there was in 2015 that found oftentimes there is a complete flip between what commercial payers and what Medicare uh, recipients are receiving. The utilization patterns can be completely flipped. Not because any one doctor is trying to treat people differently, but that's what the system creates. So if anybody's been listening throughout this conversation with Ham, um, I'd encourage them to see the Franzini article, 2010 Health Affairs, a revisit to McAllen and El Paso, and to go to the Yale Healthcare Pricing Project um, run by Zach Cooper. Take a look at the data. It's um, folks at Dartmouth have come to grips with it, that all the years we were espousing that Medicare findings extrapolate, extrapolate and can be generalized to commercial, that's been disproven. We've kind of had to eat our dirt there. So um, those are the facts. Those are the current facts since it's only been expanded since 2015. So if anybody's still listening and wants to know, please check those things out. I see member Holmes uh, has her hand raised as well. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, clarify, Mr. Davis, I think misrepresented my comments in the Addison Independent. I believe, if I'm correct, he claimed that I attributed rising prices in healthcare in Vermont to hospital consolidation. And I just wanted to pull up the actual article and say what I actually said which was over the past two decades, we have seen an increase in hospital affiliations, both in the state and at a national level. Hospital consolidation has the potential to reduce costs, increase access to services and improve care coordination, but it also tends to drive up prices and impact affordability. To my knowledge, there has not been an empirical study of the net impact of recent affiliations in Vermont. Those were my words, that's what I said. I did not claim that uh, rising prices in healthcare in Vermont could be attributed to hospital consolidation because the study hasn't been done. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe Mr. Davis can uh, maybe Mr. Davis can provide us that information if he has it. Um, Dr. Merman. Yeah. I. Thanks, um, Mr. Davis. I I took your age adjusted. Uh, comments recently and spent several hours trying to dig through age adjustment and cost of care. And I, I really couldn't find um, a great um, trend. So Maine is the highest age state in the country. And I'm just going off my memory of what I found. Vermont, New Hampshire, Florida, and maybe one other state were all 43 on average. Maine is 45. The average age in the country is 38.1. And Chittenden County, I believe, is 36, which is the youngest county in Vermont. As you mentioned, it's about a quarter of the population, but it's below the average age. So the rest of Vermont is far more expensive. And just a quick look um, per capita spending for total health care expenditure off the Kaiser Family Foundation website. I think it was, a, I believe that's 20. 21 data, but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. But basically, if Vermont spent per capita what its neighbor New Hampshire spends per capita, which is the same age, 
we would be spending about six hundred million dollars less per per year in healthcare in Vermont. And if we were Florida, and I am not going to hold up Florida as the system of healthcare that I aspire to be, um, where you have pretty high utilization compared to Vermont, high unnecessary treatments, probably high uh, potentially uh, avoidable care or, poten or potentially harmful care. But with all of that, there are a third cheaper per person per capita than Vermont. So if we spent uh, in Vermont the same amount that they spend per capita in Florida, in hospital spending, we'd spend about a billion dollars less a year. So I had a really hard time finding a really good age correlation to cost of care. Now, I think intuitively we know that it takes higher, you know, older people use more care and higher utilization, they have higher intensity of use of care. But when we look at cost, um, this this wasn't really a super strong um, uh, clear trend, the cost that age drives overall system cost. Definitely an impact, but a lot of variability that I think we could work with. Thank you. Um, uh, um, I'll just say, Mr. Davis, I appreciate you coming this afternoon and sending any data you have to help inform us as best we can all be informed. And um, is there any other public comment? We're getting towards noon and we have another hearing this afternoon. Uh, anyone else? Great. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And um, we'll see everyone at 2.15, I think, is when we start. Um, we'll take a recess till then. Thank you.